Usually, waking up because you have to go to the bathroom is annoying, but on May 26, 2013, waking up and leaving his bunk to use the bathroom was a decision that saved 29-year-old Harrison Ojegba Okene's life. Through an odd twist of fate, Harrison ended up being the lone survivor of a boat sinking at sea. He can lay claim to a unique title. He's the only person in the world to have survived on the seafloor for nearly three days. The Gulf of Guinea in the Southeast Atlantic Ocean is rich with petroleum-laden layers of sedimentary seabed. Many offshore oil rig drilling operations dot the African coast here. On May 26, about 20 miles off of Escravos, Nigeria, in choppy seas, three tugboats pitched and yawed as they performed tension tow functions on a Chevron oil tanker filling up at single buoy mooring number 3. Just before 5 a.m., the tugboat Jascon 4 was caught by a large rogue wave and capsized. Because of ongoing piracy problems in the Gulf, security protocol on the tugboat was that the 12-man crew would lock themselves in their room when sleeping. Unfortunately, this rule slowed down the Jascon Force crew when they tried to escape. The crew members had to first scramble out of their cabins, that is, except for the vessel's cook, Harrison, who had gotten up to use the bathroom in his underwear. When the tugboat keeled over and the ocean rushed in, Harrison had to force the bathroom's metal door open against the wall of water. The pressure of the water was extremely strong and Harrison was unable to follow some of his colleagues to the emergency hatch. He watched in horror as a surge overwhelmed three crew members and swept them out of the boat into the raging sea. Then the water pushed Harrison down a narrow hallway into another bathroom which adjoined an officer's cabin. Dazed and bruised but miraculously still alive, Harrison held on to an overturned wash basin to keep his head above water in the four-foot square bathroom. The boat sank nearly 100 feet, eventually coming to rest upside down on the seabed. When the tugboat capsized, there was an immediate rescue operation launched with the other boats in the area and a helicopter. A diving crew quickly located the wreck and marked the location with buoys. They banged on the hull. Harrison hammered back, but they didn't hear him. As the divers weren't prepared for deep diving, they could only stay at the depth of the wreck for a limited period of time. The rescue was called off due to no evidence of survivors. After nearly a day of being in the bathroom, Harrison got up the courage to leave his little air pocket. In pitch darkness, he swam and felt his way into the engineer's office. Miraculously, there was another air pocket here too, of about four feet high in Harrison's estimation. Having solved the immediate problem of having air to breathe, Harrison could focus on other concerns, the first one being that he was cold. In May, the surface temperature of the East Atlantic on average is a pleasant 81.9 degrees Fahrenheit, but Harrison was 100 feet down. Shivering, wet, and wearing only boxer shorts, Harrison faced hypothermia, or his body losing heat faster than he could produce it. Cautiously, Harrison felt his way around the cabin. He found some tools and used them to strip off wall paneling. With a mattress and the material from the wall, he was able to make a platform to sit on. This platform helped Harrison to stay afloat and lifted the upper half of his body out of the water, allowing him to reduce heat loss. Hungry, thirsty, cold, and stuck in complete darkness, Harrison was terrifying. He tried to think about his family. Quite religious, whenever he felt especially scared, Harrison would pray and call on Jesus to rescue him. Over time, the seawater began to remove the skin from Harrison's tongue. He could smell something rotting. He thought it was the decomposing bodies of his former shipmates. Every small sound in the dark was magnified. The creaking of the hull, the banging of the wreckage against the walls, and most horrifically, splashing and eating noises as fishes nibbled at corpses. Meanwhile, a dive support vessel, the Luek Toucan, arrived to the area of the sinking. The parent company of the Jascon 4, West African Ventures, had hired a deep sea salvage saturation diving team from subsea services company DCN Global to retrieve the bodies of the lost crew members. The six divers, deck crew, and technical staff of the Luek Toucan knew it was going to be a grueling mission. Aside from the heartrending work of recovering the dead, the boat had sunk upside down into soft mud, stirring up fine silt and creating extremely poor visibility. Ability. Furthermore, because of the security protocols, the boat was latched from the inside. Dive Team 2 consisted of Nico Van Heerden, Andre Erasmus, and Daryl Oosthuizen, with Supervisor Colby Ware at topside on the ship, helping to guide the divers via a connected microphone while watching the dive through a camera worn by Nico. The team spent over an hour breaking through an external watertight door and then a second metal door to get into the sunken boat. Once inside, it was extremely disorienting, with the ceiling being on the bottom and the floor over head. The murky water was filled with all sorts of hazards, including furniture and equipment. Slowly, 
Painstakingly, the divers explored the boat. They had recovered four corpses when Nico crawled up the stairs to the main deck. It was a tight squeeze with the diving gear on his back. He was in a small passageway getting his bearings when something suddenly reached out of the murk and touched him. Harrison had nearly given up hope when he had heard a noise that sounded like an anchor dropping. Then eventually he heard hammering on the hull of the boat. He knew it had to be divers. He banged on the wall but didn't think they heard him. Then Harrison saw the light from one of the divers' head torches as he swam through the hallway past the far end of the cabin. Unfortunately, the diver was too quick and left the area before Harrison could reach him. But then came the magical moment. You may have seen the surreal, amazing rescue footage from Nico's video when he sees what he believes is another dead body. He touches the corpse's hand, and the hand unexpectedly squeezes his. Nico has a momentary freakout as his supervisor Colby shouts through the microphone, He's alive! He's alive! Colby then tells Nico to comfort Harrison by patting him on the shoulder and giving him a thumbs up sign. The divers were amazed to find Harrison alive. The maximum depth for recreational diving is 130 feet. Generally, recreational divers don't stay at 100 feet for more than 20 minutes. In terms of the air pocket, the divers had reached Harrison just in time. A human inhales roughly 350 cubic feet of air every 24 hours. However, because the boat was under pressure on the ocean floor, scientists estimate that Harrison's air pocket had been compressed by a factor of about 4. If the pressurized air pocket were about 216 cubic feet, it would contain enough oxygen to keep Harrison alive for about two and a half days. When Harrison was located, he had been underwater for about 60 hours. An additional danger came from the carbon monoxide or CO2 buildup. CO2 is fatal to humans at a concentration of about 5%. As Harrison breathed, he exhaled carbon dioxide, slowly increasing the levels of the gas in the tiny space. However, CO2 is absorbed by water, and by splashing the water inside his air pocket, Harrison inadvertently increased the water's surface area thereby heightening the absorption of CO2 and helping to keep the gas below the lethal 5% level. The divers describe Harrison as having CO2 poisoning, being short of breath and delirious when they found him. He wouldn't have lasted much longer. The divers first used hot water to warm Harrison up, then fitted him with an oxygen mask. Meanwhile, on the surface, the dive support crew was in contact with medical and diving experts, discussing how to best help the survivor. Harrison had a new problem, what divers commonly call the bends. The bends, also known as decompression sickness or caisson disease, occurs when nitrogen bubbles form in the blood as a result of changes in pressure. If Harrison ascended directly from 100 feet underwater to the surface of the ocean, the bubbles in his blood would cause in the best case, joint pain and rashes, to the worst case, paralysis, neurological issues, cardiac arrest, or possibly even death. It was decided that Harrison would be treated as if he were one of the saturation divers coming up after a dive. Harrison spent about 20 minutes getting used to breathing through the mask. Then the divers put a diving helmet and harness onto him. They were a little worried that he would panic as they got him out of the boat and would be a danger to the dive, but Harrison continued to be cool under pressure. The team was impressed with his level demeanor. Harrison was taken from the boat and led to a diving bell, which took him to the surface. He finally arrived topside at around 7 p.m. on Tuesday the 28th of May. Disoriented, Harrison thought that it was Sunday evening and that he had only been trapped for 12 hours. He was shocked to learn that he'd been underwater for over two days. From the diving bell, Harrison was moved to a decompression chamber where he stayed for another two and a half days while his body decompressed to surface pressure. Of the 12 crew members on board the tugboat Jaskon 4, divers rescued one survivor and recovered 10 of the bodies. The search for the 11th crew member had to be called off due to dangerous conditions. Harrison made a full recovery from his ordeal and returned to his hometown of Wari, Nigeria. He didn't go to the funerals of his colleagues because he feared their family's reactions. Nigerians can be very religious, but are also superstitious. Some rumors spread that Harrison saved himself through black magic. Harrison was also plagued with survivor's guilt, wondering why he was the only one to live. Since the incident, Harrison's experienced PTSD. His wife, Akpavono Kene, says he suffers nightmares. Harrison will suddenly awake, screaming and flailing, convinced that he's underwater. Harrison has since taken a cooking job on dry land and vows to never again take a position on a boat. He made a pact with God when he was at the bottom of the ocean. When I was under the water, I told God, if you rescue me, I will never go back to the sea again. Never. April 27, 2003 an exhausted and pale young man stares into a camcorder. It's 3.05 on Saturday. This marks my 24-hour mark of being stuck in Blue John Canyon. My name is Aaron Ralston. My parents are Donna and Larry Ralston of Englewood, Colorado. Whoever finds this, please make an attempt to get this to them. Be sure of it. I would appreciate it. With his left hand, Ralston moves the camera and records his right arm. 
At the wrist, it's stuck in a narrow gap between a large boulder and a canyon wall. Past the pinch point, the flesh of his right hand has turned a sickening bluish-gray hue. Ralston explains to the camera that his hand has been without circulation for 24 hours and that he's probably going to die here, all alone, trapped in a remote canyon, but he didn't die. This is the story of how Aaron Ralston self-amputated his arm to save his life. Saturday, April 26, 2003. 27-year-old Aaron Ralston, an avid outdoorsman who excelled at skiing, hiking, and mountain climbing, was supposed to go on a mountaineering trip with his friends, but the plans fell through. He decided to take the trip by himself, and he packed some supplies and his mountain bike in the back of his truck and drove nearly five hours to the wilds of southeastern Wayne County, Utah, two and a half hours away from the nearest tiny town of Moab. Ralston parked his car at the trailhead to Horseshoe Canyon in Canyonlands National Park. Horseshoe Canyon is stunning. It's full of vast rock formations, sandstone monoliths, and deep ravines. It's remote, blue sky, big country where you can hike all day and never see another soul. It was a lovely late spring morning. Ralston's plan was to do a 30 mile loop of biking and canyoneering through Horseshoe and Blue John Canyons. He was dressed in biker shorts with regular shorts on top and a t shirt. He carried a 25 pound pack filled mainly with climbing gear. He also had a small first aid kit, a cheap knockoff multipurpose tool, two burritos, and a gallon of water split between a hydration pack and a water bottle. Ralston spent the morning mountain biking cross country. Around midday, at the end of his 15 mile ride, he locked his bike to a tree at the top of Blue John Canyon, planning to later drive his truck up to retrieve it. Ralston ran into two young female hikers and hiked with them a bit before splitting off to take a tougher part of the canyon. Ralston used his rock climbing equipment to navigate the intricate narrow passages of Blue John Canyon. After about an hour or so, he came across three large boulders wedged in a three foot wide slot canyon that he had to climb over. The second boulder shifted as he tried to scramble over it, painfully crushing his left hand and then pinning his right wrist against the wall. Ralston was stuck. He yanked at his right arm and tried to pull it free. His hand had almost instantly gone numb, but yanking was incredibly painful and the boulder, later estimated to be 800 pounds, didn't budge. Ralston maneuvered himself as best he could into a more comfortable position. He braced his legs and thrust, trying to push up the boulder with his feet. That didn't work either. Ralston's hands had lost feeling. He was experiencing compartment syndrome. This is when acute pressure is on or builds within a muscle to dangerous levels. Blood flow is decreased, which prevents nourishment and oxygen from reaching the nerves and muscle cells. The compartmentalized tissue rapidly deteriorates and begins to die. Ralston stopped for a break and awkwardly contorted himself to reach the water bottle in his pack. He chugged quite a bit of water before logical thought kicked in. He was stuck. He needed to ration his water supply. He knew the average survival time in a desert without water is between two and three days, sometimes less if the person is exerting themselves in 100 degree heat. He estimated that he had until Monday night. Ralston forced himself to relax and stop the adrenaline coursing through his body. He then took an inventory of his supplies. In addition to the food and water he had not already eaten, he had a personal CD player with extra CDs, extra AA batteries, a mini digital video camcorder, a digital camera, a three LED headlamp, climbing gear, and the multi-tool. His legs were tired of standing, so Ralston used his rope bag to pad the ledge in front of him so he could lean against it. He tried to chip away at the rock with the three-inch blade on his multi-tool but made no progress. The rock was hard and the blade dull. Ralston spent the next couple hours coming up with and discarding ideas for freeing himself. Early on, he thought about cutting his arm off but quickly shied away from that notion. As day turned into night, it grew chilly. The temperature dropped to a breezy 30 degrees. Periodically, Ralston turned on his headlamp and continued to try to chip away at the rock to stay warm. He grew exhausted, but when his knees buckled, the weight of his body tugged on his trapped arm which sent pain shooting through his system. Finally, Ralston constructed a seat. He maneuvered himself into his climbing harness and after many tries managed to throw a carabiner bundle into an overhead crack in the rock and wedge it tight so it could support his weight. For the first time in several hours, Ralston was able to sit. However, after about 15 minutes, the harness restricted blood flow to his legs, so he began sitting and standing in 20 minute intervals to rest his legs but not damage them. Over the next two days, Ralston continued to chip at the rock and also tried to construct a pulley system to move the boulder off his hand. It was to no avail. He began urinating into his empty hydration pack, saving his pee. 
Ralston experienced a host of emotions. He reminisced about happy times with family and friends. He brooded and struggled with remorse and depression over times that had gone poorly. Though not particularly religious, he prayed and spoke aloud to God, asking for help and a way out. A few times he thought he heard voices and yelled for help, but only received the mocking sound of his own voice echoing from rock formations in reply. On Tuesday, when Ralston ran out of water, he began drinking his pee. As time passed, Ralston experimented with cutting his trapped right arm. He stabbed down to the bone, but realized that there was no way his blunt knife would be able to cut through it. Ralston despaired, but eventually came to a kind of peace and acceptance of the fact that he was going to die alone in the canyon. Ralston made videos with his camcorder, saying goodbye to his friends and family. He also gave his last will and testament. He scratched his name, birth month, and year into the rock as an epitaph. He also scratched APR03. On Wednesday night, having been stuck for six days, Ralston faded in and out of trances, hallucinating. He was delirious, dehydrated, and cold. Near dawn, he suddenly had a premonition of his future. He was playing with a blonde-haired three-year-old boy in a red polo shirt. Ralston scooped the toddler up with his left arm, using his right stump to balance him and swing the child up on his shoulders while they both laugh. This vision spurred Ralston on. Before then, he thought he would perish by himself in the canyon before help arrived. Now, he believed that he would live. By now, Ralston's eyes hurt every time he blinked. There was five days of grit built up on his contacts. His gums and tongue had grown raw from sipping his acidic urine. He poked the thumb on his right hand twice. The second time, he easily slipped the blade deep, which punctured the epidermis. Due to the gases from the advanced decomposition, his arm hissed like a balloon letting out air. He smelled a fainting, rotting stench. Suddenly angry, Ralston went into a rage, yanking his arm, struggling against the boulder. He discovered that his decomposing limb was pliable, and he had the epiphany that he could bend it against the boulder until his bones broke. Ralston violently bent his arm back and forth, using his body weight to exert pressure on his arm. Finally, the torque snapped his radius and ulna bones. He then used the dull blade of his multipurpose tool to saw through the soft skin and tissue of his arm, carefully preserving the arteries. Ralston paused in cutting to apply a makeshift tourniquet made from the rubber tubing of his hydration pack, using his biking shorts for padding. He then used the multi-tools pliers to sever his tendons before continuing to cut his flesh. Cutting through the main bundle of nerves was especially painful. Then, Ralston cut through the last piece of skin and was free. Later, Ralston said the amputation and bandaging took about an hour. Ralston described the moment when he walked out of the slot canyon as being reborn, because I'd already accepted I was going to die. Meanwhile, worried friends had filed a missing persons report on Tuesday night after Ralston had failed to show up for work for two days. The police traced Ralston's credit card. It had been last used to purchase groceries in Moab. Family and friends were convinced that Ralston had gone hiking near there. Authorities started checking the southeast corner of the county and luckily came across Ralston's truck at the trailhead of Horseshoe Canyon. Search and rescue started doing flyovers in a rescue helicopter. After the amputation, a bleeding Ralston crawled and climbed his way through the rest of Blue John Canyon. With his teeth and left hand, he slowly, painfully rigged his climbing ropes. He then rappelled one-handed some 60 feet down a sheer cliff face. It was late afternoon when Ralston finally made it to the canyon floor. In bad physical shape, covered in blood, Ralston staggered through the desert. He managed to hike nearly seven miles before running into the Myers, a family of Dutch tourists. They gave him some water and hailed a helicopter from the Utah Department of Public Safety flying overhead. Ralston was rescued about four hours after amputating his lower right arm. He was only about a mile from his truck when found. Rescuers helped keep Ralston conscious for the 12-minute flight to the Allen Memorial Hospital in Moab. When they got to the hospital, he amazed them by walking into the emergency room on his own. He was stabilized before being flown to St. Mary's Hospital in Grand Junction, Colorado for surgery. Ralston had lost around 40 pounds, including 25% of his blood volume. Rescuers said that the slot canyon Ralston was stuck in was so narrow that he would never have been spotted from the helicopter. Worried that hikers would make pilgrimages to see Ralston's arm and get into trouble themselves, park authorities retrieved Ralston's arm. It's said to have taken several men, a winch, and a hydraulic jack to move the boulder so that Ralston's severed arm could be freed. Since his canyoneering accident, Ralston spent six months making a complete recovery. He quickly learned to use a prosthetic and returned to the outdoor activities he loved so much. During the 1998-1999 winter season, Ralston had begun working toward a goal of being the first person to climb all 59 of Colorado's 14ers, mountains with peaks over 14,000 feet altitude solo and during winter. 
He had climbed 45 of the 14ers prior to losing his right wrist and hand in the spring of 2003. However, the accident hardly slowed him down. In 2005, Ralston, after seven winter seasons, completed his mission. In 2008, Ralston traveled to the North and South Poles and also climbed Mount Everest. He continues to climb mountains and participate in a variety of outdoor pursuits. Ralston has appeared on several news and TV talk shows recounting his ordeal. He's made some other TV appearances too, including participating in a reality wilderness show, making a cameo on The Simpsons, and having been a game show contestant and winning $125,000 for a nonprofit land conservation watchdog. Ralston is also a motivational speaker and has given speeches discussing mental fortitude, overcoming adversity, and inspiration. He's also involved in wilderness advocacy. Ralston documented his accident in an autobiography, which has become a non-fiction bestseller. While people worldwide have been inspired by Ralston's almost superhuman tale of survival, those in the mountaineering community were less impressed. The first rule of backcountry adventuring is to tell someone where you're going or leave an itinerary of your plans. In his book, Ralston freely admits he's been sometimes reckless and stupid when it comes to taking risks in the wild. In addition to losing his arm, Ralston has been nearly mauled by a bear and was once buried in an avalanche. Aaron Ralston is not the only person to have survived a self-amputation. It's happened several times before. Notably, in 1993, 38-year-old William Jiraki was fishing a remote spot near St. Mary's Glacier in Colorado's Arapaho National Forest when a boulder fell on and pinned his leg. For three hours, Jiraki called for help. The weather turned ugly, and without a jacket or supplies, Jiraki didn't believe he would survive the night. Fashioning a tourniquet out of his flannel shirt and using his bait knife, Jiraki cut through his knee joint, using hemostats from his fishing gear to clamp the severed arteries. He then crawled a half mile back to his truck and managed to drive a half a mile to the nearest town to find help. It's been days, trapped in the darkness, deep beneath a mountain. The rain falls in torrents outside, which unbeknownst to you could mean the end sooner than you think. Your friends are quiet, and all you can hear now is the dripping of water on the cave walls. You're exhausted, hungry, clumped together with your buddies on a shelf in the cave where the flood water hasn't yet reached, but you're aware it could rise at any time, and the thought of that horrifies you. What you don't know is that the world's media and the public is hoping and praying that you get out alive praying that you are actually still alive. You huddle against your buddy to keep warm. You keep still to preserve energy. You pray for rescuers, voices from the dark abyss. But as time passes, you start to lose hope. This is the story of the Thai boys trapped in a cave, one of the most heartening and fascinating tales that people all over the world followed from start to finish. It's a story of heroism, courage, and global collaboration, already a rescue epic in the annals of true survival stories. Those boys were trapped for 18 days, and you might wonder, just how did they survive, and how did they get out? We'll start from the beginning. It was June 23, 2018, the birthday of one of the boys. He just turned 17 years old. At home, a SpongeBob birthday cake waits for him, but he won't ever see that cake. He is one of the older boys on a soccer team called the Wild Boars. The rest of the team were aged 11 to 16. There were 12 boys in total and their coach, a 25-year-old named Aki. The team had been practicing that day in their village in the Chiang Rai province of northern Thailand. This is a beautiful part of the world with endless paddy fields, jungle-covered mountains, but also incredibly dangerous caves. It's rainy season in northern Thailand, and when it rains, it really does pour. Within minutes, streets can be flooded, rice paddies drown in water, and those living in the area are well aware of the dangers of such downpours. But the boys, in their excitement after practice, wanted adventure, and that led them to take their bicycles through the rice paddies and up toward the mountain. Up there was one of their favorite spots, the Tom Luang Cave Complex. They liked nothing more than to enter its depths and explore, but this was no day for exploration. Usually during the wet season, the cave is a no-go area, due to the fact that heavy rains can fill the cave with water. The boys didn't care, or didn't know, and they parked their bikes and went inside. It wasn't as if they hadn't done this before. In the past, they'd walked as far as 8 kilometers into the darkness, only with cheap flashlights, and for them it was kind of a dare, an initiation. This day was no different, and like before, they didn't only leave their bicycles but also their backpacks. The birthday boy's parents meanwhile waited at home, and it got darker and darker. Something was wrong. Little did the parents know that the team had ventured far into this massive cave, the fourth biggest cave complex in the country. If you translate its full Thai name into English, it reads, The Great Cave and Water Source of the Sleeping Lady Mountain. That sleeping lady was known to have eaten people in the past, explorers who had entered and never come out. 
An expatriate guide working in Thailand later told the BBC that the cave was muddy and the water moved through it fast. On days of heavy rain, even the most experienced cavers wouldn't go near it. And so we have a bunch of kids who have walked far into the cave and outside an almighty storm is broken. When darkness fell and the rains came harder, the parents talked about how some of the boys had discussed going into the cave. Now there was panic and that panic turned into intense fear when the parents went into the cave entrance and saw their children's bikes and bags. Inside the cave, the boys now knew they were in trouble. Not only was rain falling outside, but it had been falling for days on end. Suddenly, they found themselves surrounded by rising water. A flash flood, it seemed, had occurred right around them. Their coach said, go, scramble, get out of here now or we're going to drown. They couldn't turn back and so moved farther into the darkness. The trail they had used was now a river, a place of no return. They passed a place that usually stayed dry, nicknamed Pattaya Beach, but even that flooded. It was their favorite spot, too. Eventually, they managed to find a shelf where they could sit. Maybe they thought the water would recede, but it didn't, and they would sit there without food for 18 days. They had flashlights, but they were told only to use them now and again. This was no time to be afraid of the dark. Aki, the coach, did make one attempt to swim through the water, but he soon swam back. It was stay or die. They used rocks to make the shelf higher, so as to stay away from the water. In the pitch black, the coach told the worried boys that the only thing to do now was to stay calm. He had been a monk in the past, and he told the boys one way to get through this was to think of nothing, empty the mind, meditate, and that's what they did. They were also quite lucky because even though the body can go long periods of time without food, water is necessary. They didn't have to resort to drinking the muddy water from the floor because natural clean water dripped down the cave walls. They had enough air because of the porous limestone rocks and the cracks, although they didn't know that the oxygen level would get lower and lower. They could survive, but for how long? Ake later told the media, I tried not to tell the boys that we got stuck in the cave. I only told them something positive, and that was it. They sat there and prayed and meditated and stayed calm, if not hungry as hell. Outside of the cave, a rescue operation involving people from all over the world was happening. Within days, there was hardly a news channel that wasn't following this operation. Thai police, government agencies, and Thai Navy SEALs were there, and unfortunately, one of those Navy SEALs would later die in the water. One problem is the complex was so massive and the boys could have been anywhere in that cave. Luckily, one boy who didn't go that day told parents and rescue teams that they liked to go to a place called Pattaya Beach. That was some help. Divers from various countries turned up, including from the UK, the USA, Australia, and China, all working with the Thai divers. Many more experts from all over the world were also involved. It was one of the British divers that made first contact, and it was videoed, a scene that brought tears to the eyes of many people. Later, one of those divers told the BBC, wherever there is airspace, we surface, we shout, we smell, we smell the children before we saw or heard them, and then they started to communicate with the kids. The Brit asks, how many of you? The boy shouted back, 13, to which he replied, brilliant, they were all alive. Many people are coming, said the diver, we're the first. Hilariously, one of the boys then shouted, what day is it? They didn't quite know the day, but told boys that they'd been in the cave for 10 days. What they did know, they were in the dark with no idea how much time had passed. You are very strong, shouted the diver. It was amazing to see those small kids all hanging together on that life-saving shelf. The divers then swam over to them using a line, and when they arrived, one of the kids said, we're very happy, almost as if he learnt the line in school. The diver replied, we're happy too. And when the world heard about this, it felt as if we'd been blessed by good news at last. The Thais smiled that day, celebrated after days of saying su su, which translates to fight fight. The boys had fought and they had won, well, almost. They even had the opportunity to write on paper to their parents, with most boys saying they loved their mom and pop and not to worry, they were just fine. The parents wrote back saying they loved them. They had a special message for Aki, who had written to the parents saying how sorry he was that he had taken their kids into the cave. The parents wrote, the moms and dads, none of them are angry at you. You went inside with them and you must come out with them too. But quickly, a new problem emerged, and it seemed that the boys were not out of trouble yet. Not by a long way, in fact. You see, they were found on day 10, and as you know, they didn't get out for quite a few days after that. These cavers that found them belonged to the British Cave Rescue Council, and they were joined by expert French and Belgium cavers. These are some of the best cavers in the world. They had literally risked their lives to find the boys, and as you know, a Thai Navy SEAL would lose his life. It was a perilous cave system, and it could take more lives, so how on earth 
Earth were a bunch of kids with no equipment supposed to get back to land. It was around 4 kilometers of extremely dangerous diving, and outside the rain kept falling. It was by no means a certainty that the boys would make it, and again, the public prayed. About this time, the search had to be stalled. It was just too dangerous as the rains were too strong. Again, people all across Thailand joined in prayer and in their heads said those words, Su Su. But now the outcome wasn't looking good. The boys wanted only one thing. Besides being rescued, they wanted food. What did they want? They asked for pad krapao, which is rice with fried meat, chilies, and basil leaves. Unfortunately, all they got was a liquid diet full of vitamins because the doctor said it was what they needed, not a spicy dish with lots of oil. At least one of the boys got to celebrate his birthday with some hope. One of the mothers of the boys said to the press, the Navy SEAL had practiced for so long and was so strong, but also died. How about a boy who's never dived before. She was absolutely right. Tech wizard Elon Musk even offered to help, saying his engineers from SpaceX and the Boring Company would create a pod to bring the boys out, but a pod just wouldn't work in such tight conditions. The rescue was stalled for the moment, but then the bad news came. More heavy rain was coming, and if the boys were not taken out soon, they would be flooded and die in the cave. It was then that it was agreed that five Thai Navy SEALs and 18 foreign divers would lead the effort. It was said the weakest boy should come out first, but Aki said everyone was fine. No one was really weak. As it happened, the boys that volunteered first would go first. Aki actually said that the boys that lived farthest away could go first, as they had the longest distance to cycle home. He really had no idea that the world was watching them, that thousands of people were outside that cave. The British divers who found the boys led the operation with many other divers following and many Thai divers waiting at checkpoints to get the guys through. As the boys could not panic, it was decided that they should be given anesthesia, so a doctor went along too. To get them out, first they had to be dressed in a wetsuit, and then a full face mask for oxygen was put over their head. They also wore a buoyancy jacket. After the anesthetic, they were rendered unconscious, and now it was about pulling them out. The problem was, or one of the many problems, was that the boy would only stay on conscious for 45 minutes, so the divers had to be trained by the doctor in how to give them anesthetic. The journey back took hours and was fraught with danger. At tight points, the boys had to be pushed hard through the cracks, but all the time the divers had to be very careful not to let anything push off their mask. The divers also held their heads high, so if anything did hit a rock, it would first hit them. We don't have to tell you that visibility was very bad. When they hit a dry section, they had to be dragged on a stretcher, their masks removed, and then attached again when it was back to another flooded section. Pulleys and chain systems were used to get them over sand, and they had to be carefully carried over rocks. It was a daisy chain operation involving hundreds of people. On July 10th, the last four boys were carried out to great applause outside the cave. It was reported that while some kids had incurred minor scrapes, amazingly they were all in good condition. The average weight loss was 4.4 pounds, which isn't so much for 18 days with nothing but water. They had to be quarantined because it was thought that they could have contracted dangerous infections, but they were fine. It was a bit sad though to see photos of their parents waving at them through glass walls. No hugging just yet. For a while, the boys also had to wear sunglasses as so much time in the dark made their eyes very sensitive to light. People tried to blame the coach for going into the cave during the rains. One British diver soon responded to that, saying, nobody's to blame, not the coach, not the boys. They were just very unlucky. It wasn't just the rain that day. The mountain is like a sponge and waters from earlier rain were raising the levels. The coach himself after the rescue said, I would like to express my gratitude for people from the whole world, officials and volunteers that came to help us. We promise that we will be good citizens to society. One of the boys that was rescued was called Titan, and he said this, I was very happy to see my dad and mom. I feel warmer. I was very happy. I cried. We think quite a few tears were shed around the world when those boys were home safe and sound. Since then, the wild boars have toured the world and have done talk shows here and there. Many people won awards for their efforts during the rescue, and well, it's just a feel-good story all around. The weather was tens of degrees below freezing, and gale force winds buffeted the two mountain climbers, both members of a mountain search and rescue team. The men were now attempting to summit New Zealand's tallest peak, Mount Cook. Yet, their many years of experience rescuing others off dangerous peaks told them that it would now be them who needed rescue. With nightfall coming, the men knew there was only one chance for survival. They had to dig themselves a shelter and ride out the worst of the weather. With climbing picks and survival axes in hand, the two men began to hack away at the snow and ice, digging through increasingly worsening weather, knowing that their lives were on the line. The next day and at the foot of the mountain, the two climbers had failed to check in. 
Don Bogey, one of New Zealand's senior most mountaineers and search and rescue professionals, wasn't worried. He knew the two men, Mark Ingalls and Phil Dooley, and he knew that they were capable and experienced climbers. Besides, he himself had to spend the night on the mountain before, snowed in by bad weather. As long as they could find shelter, they could ride out even the worst of sudden storms. Back up the mountain, Ingalls and Dooley had both dug several feet into the snow and ice, digging out an ice cave in which to shelter. Because snow is such a good insulator, the cave helped trap their body heat, but the men had no wood or other material with which to start a fire. Their only source of heat was their sleeping bags and own body heat. With the temperatures steadily dropping and storm not seeming to let up, worry began to gnaw at the back of the men's minds. Already an icy chill gripped them, and even laying in their sleeping bags fully clothed wasn't enough to keep the cold at bay. To make matters worse, the men had only brought enough food and supplies for a few days' trek. They decided that they should start to ration, having no idea when the storm could let up. The men knew that storms on Mount Cook could be unpredictable, and the storm may break tomorrow or not let up for a week or more. Stretching out what food supplies they had would be vital. On such reduced rations, though, their bodies struggled to generate heat, which only worsened the situation very quickly, taking a turn for the disastrous. A few days later, Bogey was now extremely concerned. The storm blasting Mount Cook had not abated at all. Gale force winds blasted the peaks and sides of the various approaches up Mount Cook, and anyone caught out in the open up there would not last long at all. Bogey held out hope that the men had found shelter, but he knew that the situation was very quickly turning grim. If the weather didn't break soon, they might have to send a search and rescue party out looking for corpses, not survivors. Thankfully though, the next day the weather cleared enough for a helicopter to start the search attempt. Bogey immediately volunteered to lead the search and rescue effort, and with good reason. Of New Zealand's search and rescue personnel, he was the most experienced at strop rescues, when the rescuers flown in a harness by a long tether at the bottom of the helicopter. The technique is incredibly dangerous and requires careful communication between the rescuer and the pilot, as well as nerves of steel for both. Unable to see below his aircraft, the pilot had to rely on verbal instructions from the rescuer on where to descend and how fast, or else the pilot may accidentally smash the rescuer into the side of a mountain. Yet with no hope of landing the helicopter anywhere on the steep sides of Mount Cook, Bogey knew that this was the only way of rescuing the trapped men. Until the men's location was found though, Bogey would ride inside the chopper, eyes glued to his binoculars as he and the pilot scoured the slopes for the missing men. In their gusto to find the climbers though, they were forced to take unsafe risks, once nearly crashing into a ridge when gusts of wind blew their chopper off course. The weather was still ferocious, and the helicopter was struggling to retain control. It was unsafe for the rescuers, and yet Bogey and the pilot accepted the risk, knowing that they were the only chance that Ingalls and Dooley had for survival. Ignoring the many close calls and the danger, the chopper scoured the slopes, working by process of elimination, and checking out huts and other places the men may be sheltering. Back in the ice cave, Ingalls and Dooley knew that they were in trouble. Severe frostbite had already affected them in their extremities, and both knew that they were going to be losing toes to amputation if they managed to return to civilization. Day by day though, the chill grew ever higher up their legs. The extreme cold was limiting blood flow to their legs, and slowly, from the feet up, their legs were freezing and dying. Eventually the chill would reach their torso, where it would be fatal. Food supplies were down to very meager rations, and with such low energy their bodies struggled to generate enough heat to survive. Yet from time to time, the men could hear the sound of a helicopter, unfortunately distant, but gradually working its way toward their location. The sound of possible rescue kept the men's spirits up, a fact that more than anything likely led to their ultimate survival. As any survival expert will tell you, when hope dies, the body is quick to follow. For days now, Bogey had been scouring the mountain by helicopter looking for the two stranded men. Then suddenly the weather broke enough to allow the helicopter to ascend to an area known as the Middle Peak. Taking the opportunity, the helicopter battled fierce winds and made the ascent, and as soon as they cleared the low clouds, Bogey was surprised to see the two men right there waving up at him from below. The helicopter could not land, however, and Bogey would have to be strapped into his rescue harness dangling below the helicopter back down at the base, then be flown all the way back. The weather was still far too dangerous for this, and thus rescue would still have to wait. Instead, Bogey dropped the men down food, medical supplies, and a working radio so they could keep in contact. Grateful for the food, the men tore at the emergency rations, boosting their rapidly plummeting internal temperatures. The radio helped the men bolster their fading spirits as well, 
and jokingly the men told their rescuers that they had settled into an ice cave that they dubbed the Middle Peak Hotel. Spirits and humor were still clearly up, giving hope to the rescuers that the men could be reached before they succumbed to the cold. Unfortunately though, the weather refused to cooperate, and storms once more battered the area. The radio battery quickly died, cutting off contact between the men and the rest of the world. Days passed, and at last the weather cleared enough for an Air Force helicopter to make the ascent up the peak. On its way up though, the helicopter hit dangerous turbulence, spinning it out of control and crashing it upside down onto an ice shelf a few hours climb away from the men. Inside the upside down chopper, four rescuers and three Air Force personnel pulled themselves out of the wreck. Having received only minor wounds, incredibly, the tail of the chopper hung right off a precipitous fall, and the occupants of the helicopter had avoided a several thousand foot fall to their deaths by mere inches. A rescue for the trapped crew was immediately launched, but this tied up the only other remaining chopper, and the weather window to rescue the climbers closed. The next day, the weather remained relatively calm, and Don Bogey made up his mind, today was it. They couldn't afford to wait another day or he feared the men would die and there was no telling if the weather would give them another opportunity. Despite conditions being less than optimal, Bogey strapped himself into his harness, and the helicopter slowly began its climb up the mountain, with Bogey hanging a hundred feet below it on a tether. A disaster like with the Air Force helicopter would mean his certain death. Unknown to Bogey, it's very likely that Ingalls and Dooley would have in fact not lasted another day. Ingalls frostbite was so bad that he could no longer stand, and Dooley was having trouble staying on his feet. Luckily for the duo though, after a few hours battling the winds and weather, the helicopter reached them, and slowly Bogey was lowered onto the small ice shelf where the men were sheltering. Dooley happily greeted Bogey, but informed him that Ingalls could no longer walk. With great trepidation, Bogey told the pilot over the radio to give him several meters of slack on the tether, allowing Bogey to crawl into the ice cave and pull out Ingalls who was still wrapped up in his sleeping bag. This was incredibly dangerous, as if the chopper needed to quickly rise or move due to winds, it would rip Bogey out of the cave and likely kill him in the process. Bogey however managed to drag Ingalls out and hook him up to a bag-like stretcher. Dooley would have to wait for his rescue, and Bogey and Ingalls were both lifted up into the air and then lowered down the mountain. With Dooley's position fixed, Bogey and the chopper quickly returned and successfully rescued him as well. The two men would survive their ordeal, though they would require amputations of both their legs due to severe frostbite. The men received prosthetic limbs and incredibly would continue climbing. Mark Ingalls would later become the first double amputee to summit Mount Everest. For his heroics, Don Bogey would be awarded membership to the New Zealand Order of Merit in honor of his heroic accomplishment and determination in saving the two mountaineers' lives. Suddenly, there was a thunderous rumble deep within the mountain, and everything shook. Dirt and rocks the size of a man's fist rained down. Amidst choking clouds of dust, they crouched low and ran for cover. It was every miner's worst nightmare, a cave-in. Thursday, August 5, 2010 The day began like any other day for the shift miners working at the San Jose Copper and Gold Mine in the Atacama Desert, 28 miles north of the city of Copiapó in northern Chile. However, about 2 p.m. local time, the mine had a massive cave-in. A group of miners working near the entrance escaped, but a second group of 33 miners were trapped 2,300 feet underground. Even worse, there were three miles of underground tunnels between them and the entrance of the mine. Soon, the whole world was watching as the race to save the miners unfolded. Were all 33 miners rescued? For how long were they trapped underground? How did they remain calm while waiting for help? Working at the San Jose mine was not only dirty and dangerous, but lonely too. The mine was open around the clock, with men usually working seven-day tours with 12-hour shifts. Most of the miners lived far away and would come to stay at the rooming houses in Copiapó to work for a period at the mine. While the wages were good, the job carried the possibility of death. Men had been digging for gold and copper at the San Jose mine since 1889. The whole mountain was a carved out warren of pits, canyons, and valleys connected by passageways and roads. The central road linking all the tunnels to the entrance of the mine was called the ramp. The ramp zigzagged in a series of winding switchbacks down through the center of the mine. The men toiled deep in the bowels of the mine where there was still metal to be found. Geothermal heat radiating from the earth's core made the mine hotter the deeper the men went. In addition to the heat, conditions were cramped, dusty, humid, and dark. The San Jose copper mine was also notorious for its poor safety record. 
owned by the San Esteban Mining Company, the mine had a history of serious injuries and fatalities dating back many years. Several times the owners paid off victims or their families and got cases dropped. In 2007, after an accident, Serna Hyomian, the Chilean government regulatory body responsible for supervising mining safety standards, ordered the mine closed. However, less than a year later, the mine was back in operation, having pulled some strings, even though it had not complied with the safety measures ordered by Serna Hyomian. About halfway through the day shift on August 5th, an enormous block of diorite, estimated to weigh 700,000 tons, suddenly broke loose inside the mountain and fell through the layers of the mine, collapsing sections of the ramp and other passageways. Miners who were working on different levels sheltered in place and then headed for the designated shelter once the initial cave-in was over. At the small emergency shelter known as the Refuge, the miners discovered that all connections to the surface had been lost. This meant the electricity and the ventilation and intercom systems were no longer working. 54-year-old shift manager Luis Urzua and a small group of men went exploring to see if they could find a way to the surface. They were able to make it about a third of the way up an evacuation route, only to find that the mining company had once again cut corners and had not completed the emergency ladder, making it impossible to escape. Furthermore, within about 48 hours, another cave-in would completely block the emergency exit route. The miners were stuck. Meanwhile, in the refuge, some of the miners had started eating cookies and milk from the emergency provisions. Many of them hadn't eaten since dinner the night before. Commonly, the miners avoided eating before their shifts to avoid vomiting caused by the brutal work conditions. When the search party returned to the refuge, Urzua counted the miners. They numbered 33 in total, an unusually high number of staff. There happened to be several men working overtime, and actually no one man had met all of the other miners. Urzua took control. He was straightforward about the dire situation they were in. He took an inventory of the remaining emergency rations. There was one can of salmon, one can of peaches, one can of peas, 18 cans of tuna, 24 liters of milk, eight of which turned out to be spoiled, 93 small packages of cookies, minus a couple packages that had already been eaten, and some expired medications. There were also 10 liters of bottled water. Additionally, there were thousands of liters of water stored in tanks, but the water was tainted with oil, having been used to cool industrial machinery. Meanwhile, on the surface, rescue responders, other miners, and miners' families rushed to the mine location to try to mount a rescue. On August 6, the rescue workers who were attempting to reach the refuge via a ventilation shaft were forced to turn back when a new rock slide blocked the duct. When the president of Chile, Sebastián Piñera, learned of the cave-in, he realized that the government would have to take charge of the situation. The San Esteban Mining Company simply wasn't capable of mounting a complex rescue. Against his aide's advice, on August 7th, Piñera flew to the mine to meet some of the miners' families. The president committed to bringing the miners home, dead or alive, sparing no expense. The government turned to Chile's largest mining company, National Copper Corporation of Chile, or Codelco, for help. Codelco recommended André Sugaret, a mining engineer with over 20 years of experience. To help him, Codelco handpicked a team of experts. The Chilean government also contacted other governments and mining experts worldwide. Over the next few weeks, various companies donated equipment, labor, and sent consultants and workers to help with the rescue. Also, private donations poured in to help cover the massive cost of the rescue, which by the end reached upward of 20 million US dollars. When Sogaret arrived on the scene, the San Jose mine was chaotic. Sogaret quickly established a perimeter, allowing only professionals in the restricted access area of the mine. A tent city, Campamento Esperanza, Camp Hope, quickly sprung up just outside the perimeter, populated by the press, miners' loved ones, and curious onlookers. Nearly every day, Sogaret personally updated Camp Hope on the rescue, often with the assistance of René Aguilar, a risk expert from Codelco with a degree in psychology. Sogaret and his team gathered as much information as possible to fully assess the situation. There was a chance that if the miners had survived the collapse and followed protocol, they might still be alive. However, the clock was ticking. If the miners were still alive, could the rescuers find them before they perished? Mining engineers began drilling boreholes 5 inches in diameter into the mine to try to locate the miners. This process was as difficult as finding a needle in a haystack. There weren't any completely accurate maps for the 121-year-old mine, and also drilling technology is imprecise. 
Drilling down to a target 2300 feet deep with a 5% margin of error meant that the drills could end up anywhere in the base area of over 40,000 square feet. As the refuge was about 530 square feet in size, the chance that a drill would find it was about 1.25%. Meanwhile, down below the miners were surviving on minimal rations. Each miner received two cookies, a spoonful of tuna, and a few ounces of milk mixed with water about every 48 hours. Urzua set up 12-hour shift schedules and used the headlights of the mining trucks to simulate sunlight. The miners established work areas, a sleep area, and a sanitary facility. Tempers frequently flared and the miners went through periods of hopelessness and lethargy. They itched and stank. Most quickly resorted to wearing as few clothes as possible because of the heat, but continued to wear their hard hats due to the mine's instability. Not long after the cave-in, one of the miners asked Don Jose Henriquez, a Christian, to lead a prayer. Though the miners were of different faiths, others joined in. Henriquez became known as the pastor and began leading men in daily prayers. The spiritual support helped bring unity and a sense of calm to the group. The men passed the time by sharing stories about their lives. They began calling themselves Los Treinta Tres. On August 8, three days after the cave-in, the men heard the unmistakable sound of a drill. They were excited, but knew it would take several days for the drill to reach them. The miners quickly resorted to drinking the industrial usage water as their supplies dwindled. They dealt with thick, sticky mud as the water used to limit friction while drilling seeped into their area. They despaired when they heard the sound of the drill beneath them. The rescuers had missed the refuge, drilling past it. By now, the miners were emaciated and sluggish. Hallucinations and nightmares were frequent. Many wrote farewell letters to their families. The rescuers drilled around the clock for over two weeks. On August 22nd, a borehole broke through to a ramp about 66 feet from the refuge. The miners used a wrench to tap on the drill bit. Up top, the rescuers thought they heard something and were excited to find notes attached when they pulled up the drill bit three hours later. One note said, we are well in the shelter, the 33. The messages were carefully worded and dated, a sign that the miners were not disoriented. Making contact with the still alive miners sparked a celebratory mood throughout Camp Hope and even all of Chile. The rescuers had a daunting task ahead of them. Now that they had found the miners alive, how could they sustain them and get them out of the mine? The rescuers quickly sent down a probe with a video camera. Next came a telephone receiver, then vials of glucose gel. Having consulted scientists from NASA who had experience in sustaining humans in the hostile environment of space, the rescuers slowly began to feed the men foods with specific nutrients, gradually increasing portion sizes, allowing for proper recovery. When the boreholes were being drilled, other teams of experts had brainstormed and tested various plans for rescue. None of the ventilation or existing evacuation shafts were considered viable, and they quickly realized that a rescue shaft was going to have to be drilled. It would be slow going through hard rock. The extraction shaft could take weeks, if not months. Ultimately, the rescue operation decided to pursue multiple solutions at once to ensure the best possible outcome. The plans known as A, B, and C employed three different drilling methods. Plan A was considered more reliable but was slowest. Plan B could be rapidly adjusted, but its technology was unproven. Plan C offered the greatest speed but less precision. Over the next 52 days, teams A, B, and C worked in parallel to drill rescue shafts. Plan A used a massive Strata 950 raise borer drilling rig to drill and widen a circular hole. Plan B used a SRAM Inc. T-130XD air core drill, which implemented cluster hammer technology to widen existing boreholes. Plan C employed a Rig 421 oil drilling rig, which drilled a wide escape shaft in a single pass. Meanwhile, experts including the Chilean Navy and NASA worked on building and testing a steel rescue capsule for transporting the miners to the surface. The original borehole was widened so various items could be sent to the miners. Other boreholes were drilled for ventilation. The miners became active participants in their rescue. They moved to a new shelter in a less muddy area and reinforced the ceiling, removing loose rocks. Via phone, Urzua had frequent discussions with Sugaret regarding the technical aspects of the rescue operation. Newspapers, a palm-sized television projector, and gifts were lowered into the mine. The miners learned that they had become worldwide celebrities. Promises of fame and fortune and ongoing ominous rumbling from the still-shifting mountain exacerbated tensions between the 33 miners. Finally, the Plan B team broke through to the refuge on October 9, 2010. Plan A had drilled 85% or 1,962 feet of the required depth, 
and Plan C, which had suffered frequent setbacks, had only drilled 62% or 1,220 feet. Over the next two days, the rescue shaft was widened and portions of it were quickly encased for reinforcement. Safety tests were run. Finally, on October 12, 2010, just before midnight, the first miner got in the narrow capsule dubbed the Phoenix and began the slow ascent up the extraction shaft to the surface. Nearly 20 minutes later, for the first time in months, mine foreman Florencio Avalos felt the cool breeze of a spring night touch his face. He arrived on the surface to a cheering crowd, his eyes shielded by sunglasses for protection, since they were no longer used to bright light. One by one over the next 24 hours, the miners were winched to the surface as the crowd cheered. President Piñera was on hand to greet each miner as they arrived. Overwhelmed, the miners happily reunited with their families. More than a billion TV viewers watched the rescue proceedings live. In all, the miners were trapped for a record 69 days, some 2,300 feet underground. There was a 17-day search to locate the miners, then a 52-day rescue, during which the miners had to be sustained and then hauled up to safety. No one has ever been punished for the disaster. In 2013, after three years of investigation, prosecutors said there wasn't enough evidence to file charges against anyone from the San Esteban Mining Company. The miners have had many problems since their ordeal. They were exploited by the media. Though they had some counseling, many suffered PTSD. After a whirlwind overseas tour, many had trouble reconnecting with family and setting down to ordinary life. The miners felt that they were cheated out of the profits of a movie made about their rescue. Many promised donations and job offers never materialized. Those of the 33 who wanted to return to mining had an especially hard time finding work. There was a stigma attached to them. Mining companies knew that they had government contacts, so they wouldn't hesitate to call if safety regulations weren't being followed. Nearly 10 years on, the San Jose Gold and Copper Mine remains closed. A small, on-site museum displays relics of the rescue operation, honoring the bravery of the miners and the creative expertise and spirit of cooperation which succeeded in the miraculous rescue of Los Triente Tres. As modern human beings, we take so many things for granted. Good food, clean water, shopping, healthcare, time in front of the TV, trips to the movies, sporting events, a good night's sleep, the list goes on and on. But what if you woke up tomorrow and all of this was gone? No more convenience, no more fun, and having to fend for yourself when life gets tough. Well, that's exactly what we're going to be exploring today. We'll be seeking advice from military experts, survivalists, and researching stories in the media. Welcome to this episode of the Infographic Show, how could you survive if you were stranded on an island? If you found yourself stranded on an island, you'd quickly need to forget about life's luxuries and instead knuckle down and focus on the essentials for staying alive. So let's start by looking at what those essentials are. Ross Boyer was the survival consultant on the 2014 Bear Grylls show The Island, where women and men were stripped of their luxuries of 21st century living and left for up to six weeks as part of an experiment to see if they would recapture their primeval instincts. What are some of the key survival tips they were told to adopt? Number one, three is the magic number. Three seconds before taking any action. Three hours is the longest time you should take to establish your base. And don't forget that you can last up to three days without water and three weeks without food. Number two, beware of the beach. The sand will be scorching and will be the driest part of the island, so you will dehydrate very quickly. There are also sand flies, which have ferocious bites that can get infected. And watch out for dangerous and unpredictable tides and wave patterns. Number three, what about food? Well, nearly all islands will have jungle areas, and if you know what you are looking for, the jungle can offer enough food to survive. However, there are also things to be wary of. Avoid plants with white or yellow berries. Don't eat mushrooms, as many are highly toxic, so it's not worth the risk. If it tastes bitter or soapy, then spit it out. Shiny leaves mean danger. Stay away from plants with leaves in groups of three. And avoid beans or plants with seeds inside a pod. Number four, fire, fire, fire. Fire is your friend and essential for warmth, cooking, boiling and sterilizing water, and signaling for help with smoke. So how do you light one with no matches? Focusing sunlight through a lens is ideal, but if you don't have a lens, you will need to place some dry leaves on a piece of bark and roll a stick between your hands so there is enough heat friction between the stick, bark, and leaves to spark a flame. Number 5. Stay calm. Being stranded on a desert island can leave even the most experienced campers feeling confused, scared, and panicked. But panicking causes us to lose control and stop thinking rationally. Once the realization of being lost has set in, take a deep breath and reassure yourself that help will come then get back to focusing on other areas of your survival. Number six, find a friend. 
In the popular 2000 film Castaway, Tom Hanks' character befriended a volleyball. Using blood from an injured hand, he drew a face on the ball, which he named Wilson for obvious reasons. It was his only companion during the four years alone on the island. And then there's Robinson Crusoe. Crusoe had a parrot called Pole that he befriended and taught how to speak. So find or invent a friend to keep yourself from going insane. Number 7. Have a Positive Attitude Most modern castaways are rescued within 12 hours, and most of us can last for a night. But if that does not happen, then keeping a positive attitude is essential for survival. Tell yourself every day that you can make it through. Keep pushing on. So these are the essentials, but what about putting it all into practice? Next we decided to look at a couple of real examples and see how our castaways fare. Former British Army Captain Ed Stafford spent 60 days naked and marooned on a deserted island in the South Pacific with only his video camera. No food, no water, no tools, no knife, and not even any clothes. We mentioned how important fire is. Well, it took poor old Stafford two weeks to start one, after he located the right wood. For food, he did manage to find and kill a feral goat, which he skinned, cut up, and cured. This provided him food for an entire week. Stafford got very sick at one point, but as this was for TV, his support crew flew some medicine in. Lucky for Stafford, but if it had been for real, it could have been his end. He said the biggest challenge he encountered was coping with isolation. At times, Stafford felt he was going to lose his sanity, but he survived to tell the tale. Next, we came across the story of Lucy Irvine, a British adventurer and author who spent a year on an uninhabited island with one other person to write her book, Castaway. Tuwin Island is a mile-long uninhabited strip of sand and palm trees in the Torres Strait, 70 miles from Papua New Guinea. Lucy shared her time with turtles and giant goannas. She says that food was the main focus of the day. They would hunt in the morning for sharks, presumably small ones, as she says they were easy to catch, she had a few coins and banknotes when she arrived, but money is no use on a deserted island. They tied the coins to little flags and used them as weights to get the fishing lines out. The notes became kindling for the fire. Lucy said that returning to civilization after her survival experience was a shock, and when they published her book Castaway, she became something of a celebrity and went from naked woman grubbing about in the sand for bait to a creature groomed for television chat shows. We found one other interesting story about an Australian, David Glasheen, who went from high-flying businessman to being alone on a deserted island where he has been for more than 20 years. Now 74 years old, Glasheen moved to the idyllic Restoration Island off the northeast of Australia in May 1997 after losing his fortune in a stock exchange crash. But originally, he didn't go alone. A woman from Zimbabwe went with him. Their plan was to build a 60-room luxury resort. According to Glasheen, she couldn't handle it. It was all too tough for her, and she left shortly after arriving. So Glasheen grew a beard and stopped wearing shirts, and though his plans for the resort did not work out, he decided to stay alone at the tropical castaway. Over the 20 years he's been on the island, Glasheen has survived by growing his own vegetables, as well as catching fresh crabs and fish. He's renovated a World War II outpost into a livable home, complete with solar power. But as time passed and the outside world evolved, technology has reached Glasheen, who now has internet access. So we're not sure Glasheen is technically stranded, but certainly an interesting story. So much so that he's even had a visit from Russell Crowe, who once moored his yacht and stayed for dinner. So now you know how to survive if you are stranded on an island. If it does happen, you may well be picked up within 12 hours, or perhaps you will want to stay for years like our nomadic Australian castaway, David Glasheen. Whatever happens, remember to stay calm, find food, water, and shelter, and learn how to stoke a fire. It's early Sunday morning, a beautiful day to be headed out to sea. I'm a South Korean crew member aboard the massive cargo ship, the Golden Ray. While we're capable of taking on all matter of cargo, today we're hauling a load of automobiles and shipping cargo containers, full of all kinds of household and electronic goods. The Golden Ray is massive, the size of a 70-story building, and bigger than the aircraft carriers of World War II. But keeping her afloat is a challenge, and it takes the effort of the entire crew. The distribution of the weight around the ship has to be carefully calculated. Experienced ship captains call the Ray and the ships like her floating shoeboxes. Given how very unstable they can become if the ship's load distribution isn't carefully managed, to do this we assess everything we're taking on before letting a single item of cargo onto the ship, calculating exactly how much our expected load will weigh. Then, with the help of a computer, we plot where to place each item down to the very last car or shipping container. Even a tiny discrepancy in weight could result in disaster. This time around, we were a bit rushed in taking on our over 4,000 vehicles and a smattering of cargo containers, but the crew is still confident we did our jobs well. We're headed out of the port of Brunswick in Georgia and leaving the American East Coast behind. 
But first we have to cross the St. Simon Sound before making for open water. Hurricane Dorian grazed this part of the coast not too long ago, but the US Army Corps of Engineers performed their usual post-hurricane assessment on the waterway and decided that it was safe for large cargo ships to cross. It's a great relief for me and the rest of the crew as there's no telling what might happen if we were to strike a bunch of underwater debris. While the ship's thick steel hull would prevent a puncture, we're more worried about the ship's two propellers being damaged. These could take weeks to repair and would be a financial nightmare for the company that owns the ship. After a busy night loading cars and a few shipping containers though, it's smooth sailing out to open sea. We pass by many beaches and can see the American beachgoers gawking in awe at the size of our massive ship. I always like to watch people as we sail in and out of harbor. Getting to meet new people and experience new cultures is one of the biggest reasons why I became a merchant marine in the first place. Suddenly though, the ship lists slightly to its side, just a few degrees at first. I feel a bit of alarm rising up inside of me. The waters are calm and smooth. We shouldn't be feeling the effects of the waves at all. Something else must be wrong, I realize. A growing cold feeling of dread sneaking up my spine. As if to reassure my worst fears, the list suddenly grows worse. And what started off as a two or three degree list is now about six degrees. Across the various cargo decks of the ship, I can hear car wheels squealing as they slide across the floor. The brakes are engaged and they've been chocked in place, but the list is too great to resist. As the cars shift to starboard, I know deep down inside that the ship's fate is sealed. The comparison to shoe boxes by other sea captains aren't wrong. Our ship is very wide, and this makes it inherently unstable. It requires the careful pumping of fuel and water in ballast tanks to offset the effects of high seas or sharp turns. But nothing can stop the ship from capsizing if its entire cargo suddenly shifts to one side, as is happening right now. I can hear 16,000 tires screaming as their rubber squeaks across the stainless steel floor. I barely have time to react before suddenly the entire ship lists completely on its side. Furniture and all kinds of items go flying across the room, and I'm slammed into what was formerly the right wall of our engine room. With me are two other colleagues, and I watch one of them take a pretty serious blow to the head as he crashes against what was formerly the wall and is now our floor. The waters we're crossing aren't too deep, but deep enough to completely swallow up the golden ray. Escape from the room is impossible as the door outside leads to a hallway, which is now a vertical shaft. There's no windows here in the engine room, and we're basically deep in the bowels of the ship, so there's no hope of escape. The only thing we can do is sit tight and wait for rescuers. Luckily, we're not far from port and haven't even cleared the sound to enter open waters yet. Without a doubt, dozens of beachgoers have already seen the accident and must surely be on their cell phones calling for help, though hopefully someone in the control room got a radio call out before disaster struck as well. There's nothing to do but wait. None of my training has prepared me for this. We've been trained on how to escape the ship if it began to sink, how to fight fires, even how to secure cargo in raging storms, but nothing ever covered what to do if you were trapped in a ship capsized 90 degrees and escape was impossible. The engine room is hot, really hot. The engine stopped running shortly after the accident and I'm grateful for that because any damage to the exhaust vents might have flooded the room with deadly carbon monoxide. Unfortunately, because the engines cut off, the lights very quickly died, flickering off after a few minutes, which was all the battery power the ship had. That likely means that some of the batteries were damaged, but that doesn't matter now. I'm stuck alone in the dark with two other sailors and the temperature is steadily soaring. Engine rooms on big ships are always hot, well over 100 degrees, but with no ventilation and the hot Georgia sun beating down on the ship outside, the temperature rises ever slowly upwards. As the hours go by, all three of us stuck in the engine room start stripping off clothes. We have no water, no food, and no cell phone or radio. Surely, though, people outside know that we're alive. All three of us take turns encouraging each other, pushing away terrifying thoughts of being left here to die. At least no waters entered the engine room, which means the ship isn't sinking. As the day wears on though, the heat rises. I find myself wishing that at least part of the ship would flood. I'd give anything for cool, refreshing water right now. Suddenly, we can hear banging on the hull right outside our engine room. Shouting for joy, we pick up whatever we can find and start banging back. We barely hear a voice through the several inches of steel shouting back at us. This is the US Coast Guard. We will rescue you. Hope! We're not going to steam to death in our overturned pressure cooker. An hour later, we can hear the sound of a blowtorch cutting through steel. We make sure to back away so we don't get accidentally cut or burned and await eagerly as the torch works its way through the thick steel of the ship's hull. After a half hour, we can start to see the metal on our side of the hull glowing cherry red. Then shortly after, the torch breaks through. 
It's a small hole, but it's enough to communicate with the people outside. The American Coast Guard has been pulling survivors out of the ship all day long, determined to save the life of every single crewman. I've learned that we are some of the last survivors being rescued, and that specialized equipment is being flown in to rescue us. The blowtorch can't cut a hole wide enough to free us. That would take far too long, so industrial cutters are being flown in for the job. For now, we have to remain in the overturned engine room. The heat is now over 150 degrees and it's hard to breathe. I feel faint and try as hard as I can to keep myself and the others awake. The hole that the Coast Guard cut was just big enough to push through bottles of water and food, and I didn't realize how dehydrated I was until I drank two bottles of water within seconds. I try to pace myself with the rest. I know that heat exhaustion can cause nausea and make you want to vomit the water you drink, which only adds to the dehydration. Right now, it's all about keeping our spirits up and surviving. Nighttime comes, and the Coast Guard officers outside the ship reassure us that they haven't given up on us. Don't give up hope, they tell us, and they push through more supplies. Someone always stays near the hole so we have someone to talk to. And in the darkness, the voice of a friendly rescuer is enough to keep us going. The next day, just after sunrise, I can hear the sound of what must be the industrial cutters the Coast Guard has been waiting for. Diamond-tipped saw blades start chewing into the hull of the ship, but it's agonizingly slow going. The temperature didn't improve much over the night, and we're all starting to feel the effects of extreme heat exhaustion. Luckily, the Coast Guard keeps pushing through ice-cold bottles of water for us, and the cold water tastes like heaven. Hour after hour passes, the saw is gradually getting closer and closer but impossibly slow. My head is swimming, the heat is so severe it's really starting to get to me. I talk with the others and we sing songs to keep alert and keep our spirits up. After a few more hours, the saw blades are so loud that we can't hear each other unless we shout anymore. But at least that means the rescue is close. Finally, it happens. One of the blades cuts through the steel on the wall and slowly a large opening is cut into the engine room. Coast Guard rescuers are there, waiting for us, helping to pull us out and along the small tunnel they've had to drill through the hull. In moments, I can see light for the first time in almost two days, taste fresh, sweet, beautiful air. Behind me, the air venting out of the engine room feels like a blast of a furnace, and the Coast Guard rescuers had to work with ice packs in their pockets just to stand the extreme heat. We are rushed off to the hospital, and later I learned that a fourth crewman was rescued from deeper in the ship. He'd taken refuge behind a blast-proof door, and that required a specialized saw to cut through. In the end, the ship is a total loss along with its cargo, but not a single one of us died, due in no small part to the heroic non-stop rescue efforts of the U.S. Coast Guard. Here you are again, entering the death zone of Everest for the second time in your life. And it's not just called the death zone to sound cool and attract more tourists. The region 8,000 meters above the ground earned its ominous name because of the high altitude and thin oxygen. 95% of climbers require extra oxygen here, and many have died. But that doesn't phase you. You're so close to the peak now that you can almost see the spectacular view in front of you and the sense of relief in your chest. Focused on your ever closer end goal, you take a look at the peaks below, and that's when you see the last thing you expected, a yellow blur to your left. What on earth could that be? You've not been in the death zone long, surely you can't be hallucinating already. And then you see it again. You shout at the group to stop for a while so you can take a better look. The others look toward what you're staring at and notice it too, so it must be real. But there aren't exactly many bright yellow things near the top of Everest. What could it be? Did someone drop their jacket? Did some scandalous littering climber leave some trash behind? Surely it couldn't be a person. You'd woken up early that morning with a sense of anticipation, knowing it would be the day you'd finally reach the summit. After years of training and preparation plus an eye-watering cost of 20 grand to get here, today was finally the day. It wouldn't be your first time reaching the peak, you're not some kind of noob, but still it was exciting. So you set off, feeling about as cheerful as a person who's about to enter a region with life-threateningly low oxygen levels can be, knowing you reached the peak within a few hours. But you'd not been climbing long before you caught sight of the mysterious flash of yellow, and it wasn't a piece of garbage or even an old jacket, it was a human, and he seemed to be alive too. It might not sound like a huge deal to run into a person even on Everest, but this guy was clearly out of his mind. He was sitting cross-legged on a tiny precipice with a huge precipice beneath him, flinching and swaying, and it seemed like he was trying to take his jacket off. This was a man who was probably hallucinating and suffering from frostbite and who knows what else. You wondered how long he'd been here and how long he had left. As you glance back at your group, you realize that everyone was thinking the same thing. 
Yes, everyone looked concerned and worried about a man who may be on the verge of death, but there was also a sense of disappointment in the air. Why did this have to happen now, so close to the top? Instantly, you realized you were about to face an important and unenviable choice. Look after this man or reach the peak of Everest. There was no way you could do both. It's too dangerous to stay in the parts of Everest with the greatest altitude and the least oxygen. If you were to stay with the man long enough to guide him to safety, you'd have no chance of reaching the peak of Everest. Years of training and thousands of dollars down the drain just like that. And maybe you'd never get this opportunity again. Selfish as it sounds, it was hard not to be slightly resentful at the situation. But first, you needed to take a better look at the guy and see what condition he was in. So you began the descent to where he was perilously perched on the precipice, and by the time you arrived he'd taken off his coat and was trying to strip down further. Quickly, one of your companions grabbed him so he couldn't remove more clothing, and together he made sure he put his coat back on. Even with a coat, it was hard to survive here for long. You're an experienced climber, you know what hypothermia looks like, and boy, was this man ticking all the boxes. It wasn't just him wanting to take off his coat, it was the way he was resisting your attempts to stop him like an angry child. You'd seen it before, and this wouldn't be the last time. As you first approached, he turned to you and said, I imagine you're surprised to see me here. His words took you by surprise, maybe he had his wits about him more than you expected. But these were just about the only droplets of sanity you'd get out of him. It soon became apparent that he had no idea how he got here or where he even was. However, he could tell you his name, Lincoln Hall, so it wasn't all that bad. Instead of realizing he was in the danger zone of Everest and sitting next to a dangerous drop, Lincoln seemed to think he was on a boat. He made some comment about what a great boat ride you were all on and got up, raising his arms as if he were about to launch himself off the boat and jump into the water. You and your companions jumped into action and managed to restrain him. Luckily, that wasn't too difficult considering Lincoln was so weak. You decided to keep him restrained on the ground. But who was Lincoln Hall? And how had a man who believed he was on a boat and wanted to take off his coat in freezing temperatures survived so long? So many questions. You rummaged through his coat pockets and bag, hoping to find some further clues about his identity or maybe some supplies. You found he belongs to the popular Seven Summits climbing group, but there were no supplies at all. He was here with zero oxygen and no food. Had someone abandoned him and taken all his stuff? Had another climber seen him alone and taken advantage by robbing him? Both of the possibilities seemed pretty bleak. It would have been nice to have had some extra oxygen up here, but you'd have to make do. You shared some of your oxygen with Lincoln and some snacks, which he ate under your careful supervision. Meanwhile, you tried to figure out what you'd do next. The whole group agreed you needed to call for help so he could descend to safety as soon as possible. The question was, would you stay with him or still try to make it to the top? You give the leader of the Seven Summits group a ring and were relieved to hear someone answer. You couldn't help but feel angry toward the group. Chances were, the very people Lincoln had relied on to keep him safe had betrayed him and left him to die. Who would do that? You can hear the shock in the voice of the man who answers the phone when you tell him that Lincoln Hall is in fact alive. He explains that Lincoln's group had declared him dead yesterday and had been forced to abandon him. Last night? That meant Lincoln had survived in Everest overnight with no oxygen despite being severely ill. It was insane and completely unheard of. But the man tells you he'll send some Sherpas up to where you are to help carry Lincoln to safety and bring more essential supplies. You thank him. The Sherpas are an ethnic group native to the Himalayas, many of whom guide climbers due to their amazing capacity to withstand the coldest temperatures and their strength to carry essential goods. If anyone can come to this guy's rescue, it's probably them. Before hanging up, the man whispers to you that the job of the Sherpas is to guide climbers, not to die for them. You don't reply. Maybe that was true, but what about all the other climbers? Surely you can't have been the first person to come across Lincoln over such a large time span. Is this what climbing Everest has come to now? Finally, it was time for your group to make a big decision. You could leave Lincoln here alone and hope that the Sherpas would come and safely take him back to camp while you made it to the peak of Everest like you dreamed you would, or you could wait here with Lincoln and ensure he stays alive. Besides, what if the Sherpas didn't even come? You desperately wanted to make it to the top again. There's no feeling quite like it. And you wanted those in your group who'd never even known that feeling yet to experience it for the first time. Yet you also knew the taste would be bittersweet knowing the sacrifice that had been made to get there, and if Lincoln didn't make it, you'd have to live with that forever. As you look at your companions, you only needed to share a few words to reach an agreement. You were going to stay here with Lincoln. So now there was nothing to do but wait here and hope for the best. You stay mostly in silence with Lincoln restrained on the ground. None of you say anything, but you're sure everyone feels the same. 
same way you do, mourning what could have been. You could have been reaching the top of Everest by now. Making the right decision was easy, but digesting the reality of that decision isn't, and it didn't exactly help to have nothing to do except sit and wait while a man lays beside you dying. After a few hours, you hear some voices. People! Finally! Could it be the Sherpas? Not quite. Instead, you see two dark-haired men speaking in what sounds like Italian, but still, they should be able to help, right? At first, it seems like they're trying to avoid eye contact with you. Surely, they can't have failed to see a relatively large group acting so unusually. You call out to them and explain that you need help, that there's a man here who's on the verge of death. They shout down that they don't speak English and briskly walk off. As they disappear, you struggle to process what just happened. Since when were language skills a prerequisite for carrying a man to safety or offering an oxygen mask? Well, bugger it. There's nothing for it but to sit here and wait for even longer. Just as you were about to lose faith in all humanity and suspected that the guy on the phone had been lying to you about helping, a group of Sherpas showed up. Slowly and gradually, you make the long walk down, taking it in turns to support Lincoln as he staggered and struggled. How had this guy survived so long? It was a journey of mixed emotions, knowing your journey was over prematurely, but that you'd most likely saved someone's life. It was an 11-hour trek down to the North Call camp, 7,000 meters above the ground. Hall was then taken to the base camp, and you were left to make the journey down on your own time. Everyone was safe now, but there was still plenty of questions hanging in the air. What exactly had happened to Lincoln before you arrived? And would he make a full recovery from such grotesque damage? Only time would tell. A few days later, you reached the base camp and prepared to visit with him. In a bizarre twist of events, you chanced upon none other than the Italian climbers who had ignored your plea for help the previous day. And yep, you guessed it, they were speaking English perfectly now. But on to Lincoln. The guy wasn't exactly in perfect health. Six of his fingertips had been removed due to frostbite, and he also had suffered water on the brain. But he was looking well compared to when you last saw him. At least he didn't think he was on a boat ride anymore. He explained the truth of how he'd ended up alone in the death zone of Everest. Turns out that Lincoln was an experienced climber and had made it to the peak of Everest before, but this time, as he was descending back from the summit with his group, he suddenly started to feel very ill and weak. It was a sign of cerebral edema, a type of brain swelling that leads to hallucinations and fatigue. He remembered asking his companions if he could lay down at the top of the mountain, and his group had needed to carry him down. The Sherpas had tried to revive him with no luck. Lincoln only got sicker and sicker to the point where the Sherpas declared him dead after he'd shown no signs of life for two hours. Worried about running out of oxygen and causing more deaths, they opted to leave him for the greater good of the group. And before they went, they took all his supplies for their own use, like the oxygen mask and food. Nobody was sane enough to have a good idea of what had happened after that, but it seems like Lincoln probably fell asleep then wandered off, gradually getting sicker. We'll never truly know how he survived. He's not the only one who has survived such a crazy feat. Another climber, Beck Weathers, was left for dead on Everest but ended up making his own way back to camp. January 26, 1991. Night. The Iraqi Desert. Two SUVs barrel across the moon-bright desert toward Chris. He crouches low, getting into position. His body shakes from the wild pounding of his heart. He breathes deep and thinks of his two-year-old daughter. His hand steadies. The vehicles are closer now, 55 yards away, then 40 yards, 30 yards. At 20 yards, he pulls the trigger. A rocket whooshes from the launcher. The first SUV explodes with a heavy bang, thick smoke billowing up. Chris launches a grenade at the second SUV, nailing its hood. Then he pops up and charges toward the vehicles, spraying bullets in case there's anyone still alive in the wreckage. Satisfied that he won't be chased anymore, Chris turns and runs until it feels like his heart is going to burst. For now, he's escaped the enemy. He doesn't know if anyone else in his patrol is alive or dead. His only chance for survival is to walk across the desert and cross into Syria. It was supposed to be a straightforward mission. During build-up to the ground invasion of Iraq, B Squadron of the 22nd SAS is stationed at a forward operating base in Aljuf, Saudi Arabia. Three eight-man patrols, Bravo 1-0, Bravo 2-0, and Bravo 3-0, are to infiltrate deep into Iraqi territory on intelligence-gathering missions. The main task of Bravo 2 is to find a good lying-up position and set up an observation post to monitor the main supply route, or MSR, that runs between the town of Hatida and three airfields. It's thought that the Iraqi army is moving Scud missile launchers along this route. The patrol is to report on enemy movements via radio or satcom. After 10 days, a chopper will resupply them or move them to a new location. Bravo 2 consists of Patrol Commander Sergeant Andy McNabb, Sergeant Vince Phillips, Corporal Chris Ryan, Lance Corporal Dinger Pring, and troops Bob Concilio, Legs Lane, Stan McGowan, and Mark Cover. 
On the night of January 22nd, an RAF Chinook drops the soldiers into the Iraqi desert. Unlike the other two patrols, Bravo 2 opts to travel on foot instead of bringing vehicles. It's a decision they'll soon regret. The mission gets off to a rough start. The desert's colder than expected. It's hard work moving their heavy equipment. They've misjudged the terrain from poor, outdated maps. Bravo 2 soon realizes that the spot they're in is hot. There's an anti-aircraft encampment less than a quarter of a mile away. Legs, the patrol's radio man, has trouble contacting command on the radio. The day after their insertion, Bravo 2 is compromised, when a young goat herder stumbles upon them and then alerts other people. In the afternoon, the patrol finds themselves hunkered down in a wadi or a dry river channel. From about 219 yards away on a bluff, two Iraqi men watch them. It's a tense moment, and then Chris makes a bad mistake. He waves. It's meant to be a disarming gesture, but he waves with his left hand, which is offensive in Arab culture. The men instantly begin firing their weapons. Bravo 2 returns fire and the situation rapidly deteriorates. The Iraqis are quickly joined by a dump truck full of men with AK-47s. As the firefight rages on, the patrol retreats further down the riverbed, struggling under the weight of their heavy haversacks while shooting and trying to evade getting shot. Chris activates his Tactical Rescue Beacon or TACB and yells that they're under attack. Andy also activates his TACB. Though their beacons are set to different frequencies to alert both the US and SAS forces, neither gets a response. Bravo 2 ditches their biggest packs so they move faster. Legs leaves behind radio equipment. At the last minute, Chris runs almost 20 yards back to get a hip flask his wife had given him as a present out of his discarded pack. Miraculously, the patrol escapes the Iraqi fighters. They regroup some distance away. Amazingly, no one had been hit, but they lost a lot of their gear. Not sure if their communications have gone through, they decide not to wait for a rescue to show up and head for the Syrian border. As dusk falls, Bravo 2 detours and doubles back through the rough, rocky terrain in case they're being followed. Then they walk south. Periodically, Mark switches on his GPS to get a fix on a satellite. They then check their maps to determine which way to go. After walking for several hours, Stan collapses. He has on thermal underwear and the fast pace has caused him to sweat hard. He's dehydrated. Chris, who's trained as a medic, gives him rehydrate powder mixed into water. Some of the others want to find a safe hiding spot and leave Stan behind, but Chris won't allow it. He cajoles and threatens the semi-conscious Stan into continuing to walk. When they venture near the MSR, fearing discovery, Chris sets an even more punishing walking pace. Stan and Vince keep up with the rest of them. After about an hour, they pause to consult which way to go and discover that the rest of the patrol, Andy, Bob, Mark, Legs, and Dinger, are missing. From higher ground, they pause to look out over the desert floor, but don't see the missing soldiers. Chris turns on his tack beat, and to see if by chance Andy has his on, they'd be able to communicate. Unfortunately, there's no answer. The patrol is down to three soldiers. Chris, Stan, and Vince walk on, occasionally trying to contact Andy on the Tacby. At around 5 a.m., having hiked some 43 miles through the night, they take shelter in a ditch. They take turns sleeping and keeping watch. As the day wears on, it grows colder and begins to snow. After resting, Stan seems better. Chris's feet are beginning to grow blisters due to his rough wool socks. The three snuggle together in the muddy, snowy ditch until dark. At night, they set out, trying to navigate toward the border via compass. They walk for hours in the freezing cold. Vince gets belligerent and loses his grip on reality due to hypothermia. Eventually, he falls behind. Chris and Stan briefly retrace their steps, but they can't find him. Chris makes the difficult decision to press on, and Stan agrees. The patrol is now down to two. After walking for hours, near morning, Chris and Stan cuddle for warmth in a wadi and sip whiskey from Chris's flask. Thankfully, it's a sunny day and they're able to dry out some. Chris eats two biscuits and the last of his food. They've lost track of time, but they think it's Saturday, January 26th. Midday, they hear the jingling of bells. Goats. Along with the goats comes the threat of them being discovered again. Chris wants to ambush and kill the herder, but Stan doesn't want to kill a civilian. Against Chris's wishes, Stan steps out of their hiding places and tries to communicate with the herder. Unfortunately, the surprised herder doesn't speak English and they don't speak Arabic. Stan decides to go to the nearby village with the herder. Chris begs him not to go, but Stan's adamant. Chris tells him he'll wait until 6.30 p.m. for Stan to come back. As promised, Chris waits until dusk for Stan to return before checking his compass and walking north. He's walked for about 15 minutes when he sees the lights of an approaching SUV. 
thinking that it's Stan, he runs toward the SUV, and that's when he notices a second set of headlights. Stan would never send two vehicles. Chris turns and runs from the SUVs, and that's when they begin to chase him across the desert. After Chris destroys the SUVs with his rocket launcher, he continues his trek toward Syria. Now out of water, he keeps thinking that he should reach the Euphrates River soon, but doesn't. Eventually, he sees a small village with crops. Surely they're near the river. Chris stealthily skirts the village as the dogs start barking. At the river, he tries to fill his water bottle, but discovers that the water is shallow over a layer of silt, so he wades out further and ends up getting sucked down by quicksand. Luckily, Chris is able to struggle free. He carefully fills his water bottle, and the water is murky, foul-smelling, but it tastes good. Chris realizes he can't cross the river, it's cold, and the middle current is too strong and unpredictable. He has to go another way. Chris spends the next few nights hiking through the desert, occasionally zigzagging miles out of his way to avoid villages, vehicles, and goat herders. He sips a little whiskey when he needs a pick-me-up. With each step, his blistered feet grow more painful. During the days, he hides in the wadis or culverts and rests. Sometimes he turns on his tack bee, but there's never any answer. He consults its map, but has trouble lining up landmarks with it. Chris crosses the MSR again and becomes demoralized by a highway sign, which announces that Al Qaim is 50 kilometers, which means that the Syrian border is 80 to 90 kilometers away. He thought he was much closer. The lack of water becomes an urgent problem again. Starting to get careless from exhaustion, Chris stumbles into a signal base, but manages to avoid the soldiers, at times crawling and shimmying across the ground. He finds a clear spring and fills his water bottles. Then Chris accidentally wanders into the large compound of a local politician. A huge portrait of Saddam Hussein is painted on one of the buildings. As the day approaches, Chris is deciding where to hide when he realizes that two men are headed in his direction. There's no way they won't see him when they pass. Despite his exhaustion, Chris's training takes over. He ambushes the men, stabbing one in the throat with his knife. He wrestles the other man to the ground and, using a judo hold, snaps his neck. He drags the bodies into the tall grass by the riverbank to hide them. Chris takes refuge in a stinky sewer culvert full of rotting trash and feces. He can barely maneuver his stiff fingers to open his water bottle. Finally, he gets it open and takes a sip. The water tastes metallic and seems to burn Chris's mouth. He spits it out and uses his flashlight and compass mirror to check his tongue. Everything looks okay. He tries a second mouthful of water with the same reaction. Clearly, the water's bad. Chris dumps it out. Very disappointing. It's been eight days since he had a proper meal and two days since he's run out of water. Chris's feet continuously ache, but he doesn't dare take his boots off because he doesn't know if he'll be able to get them back on. Furthermore, he's lost feeling in the tips of his fingers, and due to the dirt stuck under his fingernails, infection has set in. Chris dozes uncomfortably in the culvert, waiting for dark. At night, Chris is finally able to escape the compound area. He limps toward the town of Krabila but can't find it. Later, he'd learn that Krabila was blacked out due to war and he'd gone right past it. Eventually, Chris comes to a big barbed wire fence. Finally, is this the border? He manages to cross it with only minor injuries and staggers on. Suddenly, there's a blinding light and Chris wakes up sometime later. He drags himself to his feet and keeps going. He has several random blackouts. Chris sees a dwelling in the distance and makes for it. He turns on his tack bee. If need be, he'll kill someone for water. The goat herd family, although surprised and rather suspicious, helps Chris. He manages to ask where he is and they can confirm that he's in Syria. They give him water, sweet tea and flatbread, but he can't swallow it. For the first time in days, he takes off his boots. His feet are rotting, the toenails falling off. An older woman washes his feet. For a while, he's able to lay by a fire, warming his feet and letting them breathe. Through sounds and sign language, Chris communicates that he wants to go to the police. He gives the family a gold coin for their help. That actually makes things grow tense. They want more money and threaten him with an ancient rifle, but he mimes that he's out of money. The young man is aggressive about taking Chris to town, so Chris carefully eases his feet back into his boots, and he and the young man stand on the side of the MSR and hitch a ride. The camel farmer driver who picks them up speaks a little English. Chris lies to him, saying that he's a crashed airline pilot. Halfway through the ride, the driver kicks the young man out and sends him back home. Chris starts to worry. In the tiny town, they stop for gas. The farmer gets belligerent. Chris tries to bargain with him. The farmer whips up a crowd of people. Chased by a mob, Chris runs into a police station. The police take away his kit and open it. It's a tense moment when they find his 203 automatic rifle grenade launcher. Luckily, an official who speaks English shows up and asks for information. Chris provides his correct name and birth date, but lies about his regiment and repeats the crashed pilot story. 
Strip searched, blindfolded, and two wild car rides later Chris ends up in Damascus. He's delivered to the head of the Mukhabarat, the Syrian secret police. The secret police allow him to finally get properly cleaned up. For the first time in several days, Chris sees himself in a mirror. He's gaunt. He's dropped from 176 to 140 pounds, losing 36 pounds in 10 days. Though the authorities provide him with a feast, he can't eat. He can only drink water. For Chris's request, they take him to the British Embassy. He's questioned by Embassy Brass and writes down his whole story. They work out the route he took and chances are the spring he drank from was contaminated with nuclear effluent. After a few days of government red tape, Chris flies into a base in Cyprus. From there, he ends up in Riyadh, where he's interviewed multiple times by the brigadier and colonel in command of the special forces. The rest of Chris's patrol is still missing. No one knows what happened to them. The other patrols, Bravo 1 and Bravo 3, had declared their areas too dangerous upon arrival and had been extracted shortly thereafter. As it turns out, legs had been given the wrong radio frequencies, and the base only received three garbled messages on January 24th. The army waited two days before mounting a search, which had to be aborted due to bad weather. Another search was mounted on the 27th with the focus on the most likely escape route, but they didn't find the patrol. A third search was also aborted, this time due to an ill pilot. On February 24th, the ground war launched and was over in five days. As it turns out, five members of Bravo 2, Stan, Dinger, Mark, and Andy were separately taken as POWs, ultimately ending up in the same prison. Eventually, they were handed over to the Red Crescent and released after the war. Legs died from hypothermia while trying to cross the Euphrates. Bob died after being caught in a firefight, and Vince died of exposure in the desert. The patrol originally broke into two because Andy heard a jet and stopped to use his tack beat. Bob, Legs, Mike, and Dinger had been behind Andy, so they stopped with him. After trying to contact the jet, the men saw movement ahead and thought it was an Iraqi patrol, so they stayed put until the patrol moved on, and by that time, Chris, Vince, and Stan had vanished. Chris physically recovered in about six weeks. The dentist had to remove some loose teeth, and Chris's gums had receded due to malnutrition. He also had a blood disorder from drinking dirty water and a high level of enzymes in his liver produced in reaction to the nuclear affluence. Thankfully, he didn't have radiation poisoning. It took Chris much longer to overcome the recurrent nightmares and psychological scars the mission caused. In all, he walked just under 200 miles in 10 days. It was a boiling hot summer day. The temperature is easily over 100 degrees. The woods all around me are silent, but I know they're out there looking for me and my partner. We can't rest long. We've been on the run for 18 hours straight since last night, and we're both exhausted. Grudgingly, we pick up our aching bodies and push on into the thick brush once more, checking our compass to make sure we're on the right heading. I'm somewhere in the deep woods of the southern United States, in a military land navigation and survival training program. Six months ago, I was just a regular teenager, and now I'm hiking through the deep woods on the alert for the squad of instructors whose job it is to hunt me and my partner down. Our goal is simple. We have to reach three different waypoints and check in with an instructor at each, before hitting our extraction site. The total course is about 30 miles, but the waypoints are set up so that you have to take a long winding path to get to each, and they each have to be hit in succession, causing you to double back for part of your route. The entire time, there's six instructors hunting you, and if you get caught, you fail. If you miss a waypoint, you fail. If you take longer than 36 hours to complete the course, you fail. Failure means you get washed back, have to try the entire program again with a different class, or you simply get kicked out of the program entirely. I don't want to fail. Before we set off, we are given a crash course on all the natural hazards in this part of the American South. Alternating between swamp and forest terrain, there's the threat of snakes, alligators, venomous spiders, killer bees, and last but not least, fire ants. We all paid attention during the briefing, but I think most of us were worried about alligators and snakes. How bad could insects really be? I'd soon find out. Eventually, my partner and I made our way to a road that cuts through the woods, and we approached very carefully. Roads are danger crossings, because the moment you step out of the wood line, anybody within two miles could have a clear line of sight of you. You typically want to cross a road in the middle of a bend. That way, no one can have a direct line of sight to you past maybe a few hundred meters. No such luck here, though. This road is long and straight, and though it probably makes a turn a few miles down or up from us, we're not sure and we can't risk adding miles or hours to our time. We find a sheltered spot with a good view of the road to sit and wait. 
taking the opportunity to eat a quick meal. We've been given one meal ready to eat or MRE each for the 36 hours we're expected to complete the course, so hunger is ever present. We've been encouraged to forage, even hunt if we can manage it. In fact, I think we're expected to. There's no way a single MRE can give you the calories you need in this heat when you're on the move for a day and a half straight. We munch on a few edible roots we managed to dig up early this morning, as well as a small portion of the MRE. We decided to use the MRE to supplement whatever food we find out here in the wild rather than eat it outright. As we rest, we watch the road for 30 minutes, waiting to see if there's any traffic. It's a small two-lane road and after a half hour we don't spot any vehicles so decide it's safe to cross. A normal danger crossing would have one or two members crossing at a time, while the rest of the team took up overwatch positions to give covering fire if need be. We're unarmed though, so decide that it's best we cross together as quickly as possible. We identify a spot with great concealment in the woods on the other side of the road that's fairly close to the road itself, and we slowly start making our way to the road on our side. Suddenly, there's the sound of an engine, and in a flash we both hit the floor. My partner manages to get behind the thick bush, but I'm a little more exposed than he is, so I roll behind a thick fallen log. I got a little too much momentum though, and to stop myself, I reach out with my left hand and brace against the log. My hand pushes into the soft, rotten wood, but I don't notice. A Humvee with someone in the turret is slowly making its way down the road, and I can see a glint of binoculars, which means this person is looking in my direction. I freeze immediately, barely breathing, even though I'm suddenly out of breath from panic. Before we set out, my partner and I had put on thin-skinned black leather gloves, and then we used duct tape to close the gap between the gloves and the sleeve of our uniform blouse. We did the same with our pant legs, tucking them into our boot and then using the duct tape on top of the boots. This is so that fleas, ticks, or any matter of insect would be unable to crawl inside our uniform. It also means our hands and feet are hot as hell, but we stop every six hours to let them breathe and wipe up excess sweat from our feet so they don't start rotting away. As I am carefully watching the hum moving our direction, I'm not paying attention to my left hand. Unbeknownst to me, when I reached out to brace myself against the fallen tree trunk to stop my roll, I punched into the soft rotting wood and straight into a nest of fire ants. The ants are now angry, extremely angry, and they are on the warpath. Dozens upon dozens of them have already begun attacking my gloved hand, but thanks to the tough leather, I feel nothing. Now they're moving their way up my hand to my arm, and because my uniform is sealed at the wrist, they can't find a way in. They can only keep marching up my arm, closer and closer to my neck, and the only entry point to attack my body, and I am completely unaware that any of this is happening. The Humvee is moving slowly, the person in the turret carefully scanning with binoculars. He looks in our direction and I remain utterly motionless, holding my breath so that I don't accidentally make a small leaf or twig move as I inhale. Then I feel a sharp pain on my neck. A moment later, a second sharp pain. Great, some bug just bit me and it's probably still crawling around on me. I just hope it's not venomous and I push the thought away. I can't move. I can't give myself away. I can't fail my training. Then there's three more sharp pains, and a second later a dozen all at once. Now I know something is seriously wrong and I can't help but turn my head and look at my shoulder. I almost wish I had it. My arm, all the way up to my shoulder, is a black and red mass of ants. My hand is wrist deep in their nest, and the angry ants are swarming by the hundreds covering every square inch of my uniform and finding a way inside it through the top. Fire ants are an invasive species to the United States as well as many other nations and regions around the world. Believed to have been accidentally brought to the US in shipping crates, fire ants quickly set up shop all across the American South, and every year they push just a little bit further up north. While they can't survive cold weather for long, thanks to global warming, the maximum range that they can inhabit has been steadily increasing year after year. Amongst ants, they are known as one of the most aggressive species and regularly kill birds and small mammals. They've even been known to bring down larger livestock when it couldn't flee after stumbling into a fire ant nest. The US spends millions of dollars every year in treatment for fire ant bites, as well as measures to attempt to control the insects. For a long time, it was feared that the ants would even drive many species of native animals extinct, most notably lizards, which are unable to flee fast enough to save themselves. Over the last seven decades, though, American lizards have evolved longer legs and new behaviors to avoid fire ants. Now these tiny aggressive invaders were busy invading me. 
and every second dozens more poured inside the top of my uniform. The horror of discovering my entire left arm and shoulder covered in a solid mat of ants was too much for me, and I immediately rolled away from the nest. Part of me tried to fight for control to maintain my discipline, but now my brain was kicking into survival mode and the pain was becoming incredible. I was being bitten by dozens of ants every second. I had to do something. Fire ants attack prey and intruders by biting down with their pincers, and then using their pincers for grip, stabbing repeatedly with the stinger in their abdomen. Often an ant will bite in a circular pattern as it turns over and over stinging repeatedly. This is what makes fire ants unique amongst most ants, the ability to sting multiple times. When the ant stinger penetrates the flesh, it injects a toxic alkaloid venom called solenopsin. For humans, this is typically not dangerous unless you're allergic, much like a bee sting, but it does produce intense burning pain, hence the name fire ant. Recently, though, scientists have discovered that a fire ant's venom might actually affect the nervous system itself, which might account for reports of hallucinations by victims. The ants were now inside my uniform, though thankfully I was wearing a tight-fitting compression shirt beneath my blouse. It fits snugly enough against my body that a lot of the ants can't find their way under that to get to my chest, but at this point I'm covered in so many ants that plenty do. In a panic, I leap up and rip off my blouse, tearing away the duct tape that keeps it securely attached to my gloves. At this point, my partner has realized that I'm covered in hundreds of ants, and forgetting all about our test, he makes a break for the Humvee to flag it down for help. As he's running, I'm stripping out of as much of my clothing as I can because by now the ants have gotten down my compression shirt and are stinging my chest and back. Stumbling and wiping away dozens of stinging ants from my body at a time, I work my way toward the road, and in seconds, someone's grabbed me by the shoulders and is dragging me toward the Humvee. At this point, my vision becomes hazy, my hearing is slightly distorted, and I can't quite tell what's going on. I'm laid down on the road, and one of the instructors grabs a can of diesel fuel from the back of the Humvee and douses my entire body with it. Fire ants are pretty unaffected by water but in an emergency, gasoline or diesel can irritate ants and force them away. I can hear someone on the radio calling for a medevac, but everyone's voices sound distorted. I can't make out much of what's being said and my vision is getting dark around the edges. The pain, which was like searing hot fire across my body, is fading away too, which is nice. The next thing I know, I'm waking up in a medical tent, an IV in my arm, and a medic standing at the foot of my cot. I find out that I was unconscious for an hour, but my heart rate and breathing remained strong so they canceled the medevac flight to the hospital. The medic asks me how I'm feeling, and I tell him that I can taste iron in my mouth and that my body feels like it's on fire. My arm is covered in dozens of small red bumps, each one a different sting, and when the medic holds up a mirror for me, I'm horrified to see that I have dozens upon dozens of stings all across the left side of my face, down my neck, shoulders, the upper part of my chest, down my arm to the elbow. It almost looks like I have severe chicken pox, but in just a few areas of my body. A military ambulance takes me back to the training depot, and there I see the doctor at the attached clinic. He tells me that I'm thankfully not allergic or else I'd be dead, as I received well over a hundred bites all across the upper left side of my body. He wants me to get checked in at the hospital though, just to monitor my condition as a cautionary measure. I ask him what that'll mean for my training and he tells me that I'll get washed back but be allowed to repeat with a new class in a month. I've been through hell with my class by now, pushing each other along when each one of us wanted to quit at some point in our training. We started with 40 and are down to just 15 of us. At this point, I'm closer to these guys than almost anyone else in my entire life. I don't want to quit now. I don't want to finish with another team. I beg the doctor to let me stay. Eventually, he calls in my training unit commander, who tells me to shut up and follow the doctor's orders. I beg him this time to let me stay. He thinks about it, asks the doctor if it's even possible. The doctor says that if I survive the initial stings, there's little danger now, but it won't be pleasant for me. I shrug, tell them both that I'll deal with it. My commander agrees, but warns me that the only slack I'll be cut is not being forced to wear camo paint because of the risk of infection on my bites. I'll be expected to keep up with everyone, do everything else everyone else does, no quarter given. I agree, and the next day, me and my partner are forced to restart our navigation course from scratch. He doesn't mind though, he was given the option to finish alone the day before, but he refused, because that's what family does. Over the next few days, the bites harden into small white lumps. The doctor wasn't kidding. Training becomes even more of a living hell. The bites hurt bad due to the constant rubbing of my uniform and body armor against my skin. Soon they start to ooze pus, and at the end of each day my shirt is covered in salt-encrusted sweat and pus. 
I was given a cream to use to prevent infection and ibuprofen for the pain. The cream apparently works, but the ibuprofen doesn't even touch the intense pain. The nights are the worst though. The temperature stays close to 100 degrees and I'm so miserable I can barely get any sleep, and we've already been sleep rationed anyway. I push through it though. Eventually the small white lumps harden and many of them tear off due to friction from my skin and my uniform on my gear. I'm carrying up to 80 pounds sometimes and it's sheer agony, but I keep on anyway. After a week, I'm exhausted and on the verge of total collapse, but my bites have finally begun to fade and this phase of my training is nearly complete. When we leave this phase of training a few weeks later, my unit commander approaches me and shakes my hand. He doesn't say anything, just shakes my hand and nods. He doesn't need to. A year later, I'm with my active unit, but I hear about an accident back in training. Some new kid was sleeping out on one of the courses in the middle of the night. Fire ants came across him. He got bit all over his body and woke up in the middle of it. He ended up having a worse reaction than me and was medevaced out, nearly died from it, and they ended up giving him a medical discharge from the military. To most people, fire ants are a nuisance, but to this day, whenever I see any type of ant, I can't help but shudder and I thank my lucky stars that I wasn't born allergic to fire ant venom. She was exhausted, but she needed to keep moving. Her head throbbed with hunger. Every part of her body ached. She was covered in mosquito bites and had second-degree sunburns. Her wristwatch stopped long ago, but she tried to estimate how many days it had been since she had fallen from the sky. At twilight, she heard voices and thought that she was imagining things again. But then, three men walked out of the rainforest and were stunned to see her. I'm a girl who was in the Lanza crash, she told them. My name is Juliana. Born to German zoologist parents Maria and Hans Wilhelm on October 10, 1954, Juliana Kopka had an interesting childhood. Her parents worked for the Museum of Natural History in Lima, Peru. When Juliana was 14, her parents decided to leave the city and set up Panguana Ecological Research Station in the Amazon rainforest. For the next two years, Juliana was homeschooled and accompanied her parents on research trips into the jungle, where she learned plant, animal, and insect identification and various survival techniques along the way. Educational authorities disapproved and Juliana was forced to return to Lima to finish high school. In December of 1971, Maria came to the city to collect 17-year-old Juliana, the plan being to visit her father for Christmas. Although her mother wanted to leave sooner on the 20th, Juliana had a school dance on December 22nd and a graduation ceremony on the 23rd. After pleas from Juliana, her mom agreed to fly out on Christmas Eve. Unfortunately, all the flights were booked, aside from one with Linus Aires Nacionales Sociedad Anonima, Lanza. The airline had a poor safety record, and Hans Wilhelm had previously urged Maria to avoid flying with the company, but Juliana's mother thought they'd be fine. Just before noon on December 24th, Lanza Domestic Passenger Flight 508 departed Lima's Jorge Chavez International Airport bound for Iquitos, Peru, with a scheduled stop at Pucallpa, Peru. The first half of the 70-minute, 304-mile flight to Pucallpa was normal. Then the Lockheed L-188A Electro turboprop aircraft which was traveling at around 21,000 feet, flew into a thunderstorm. A later investigation determined that the crew, feeling pressure to meet the holiday schedule, decided to continue the flight, despite the treacherous weather ahead. As the plane dipped and heaved due to turbulence, luggage and Christmas presents fell from the overhead lockers. Scared passengers screamed and wept. Suddenly, there was a bright flash as a lightning strike ignited the fuel tank in the right wing, blowing a hole into the plane. Juliana remembers Maria saying, that's the end, it's all over. Those were the last words she ever heard her mother speak. The plane disintegrated about two miles above the ground. Juliana, still strapped into her airplane seat, spun head over heels, the wind whistling in her ears. She lost consciousness only to regain it and lose it again as she free fell to the ground. Sometime later, Juliana came into the rainforest, wet, muddy, and alone. She huddled under her airplane seat, fading in and out of consciousness for the next 19 or so hours, throughout the rest of the day and the night. The next morning, Juliana took stock of herself. Her neck, shoulder, and ankle hurt. She had a large gash on her arm, and her right eye was swollen shut. She wore a very short, sleeveless mini dress and one white sandal. Aside from the swelling, she was nearsighted and had lost her glasses. However, her watch still worked and she knew it was around 9 a.m. Maria's airplane seat had landed next to her daughter's, but it was empty. Dizzy, Juliana crawled on all fours and searched the area around her crash site. She marked trees to keep her bearings and called for her mother. Hearing nothing except the sounds of the rainforest, she felt scared and helpless. 
After some time, Juliana forced herself to stand. At first, she was wobbly, but gradually grew steady on her feet. Thirsty, she drank raindrops off of leaves. She heard planes overhead searching for the wreck, but due to the dense tree canopy, couldn't see them. She realized that she needed to get somewhere wide open where she could be seen by rescuers. Juliana headed off into the rainforest. As she walked, she tested the area in front of her by throwing her remaining shoe ahead, then moving forward to pick it up and tossing it again. Snakes could be camouflaged as dry leaves, and she didn't want to step on one or any other creature. The only sign of the crash Juliana found was a bag of candy which she promptly ate, saving a few pieces for later. The trek was rough going, with uneven terrain. She frequently had to climb over or squeeze under huge logs that blocked her way. Eventually, Juliana found a small creek and followed it. Having been taught that following water leads to rivers, which often means civilization and people. Over the next day or so, Juliana stumbled through the rainforest, following the water as it slowly grew from a trickle to a stream. Other than candy and water, she didn't have anything else to eat. Since this was the rainy season, there was no fruit for her to pick. She didn't have any tools to help her cut trees, catch fish, or cook roots. Also, she was aware that many of the plants that grew in the jungle were poisonous. The days were sweltering, humid, and it frequently rained. At night, the temperature dropped. Juliana cowered under bushes, curled up, shivering in her mini-dress. She was constantly attacked by insects, especially mosquitoes. Flies laid eggs in the wound on Juliana's arm. She squeezed it, but wasn't able to get them out. She worried that she'd lose her arm. As she walked downstream, Juliana saw more evidence of the plane crash. She heard the call of a king vulture and suspected that there were dead bodies nearby. Eventually, she came across a row of seats with three dead people still strapped in. The passengers had a head-first impact and hit the ground so hard that they were buried almost two feet into the dirt. Juliana was horrified. Judging by their clothing, two of the victims were men. To make sure that the woman was not her mother, Juliana took a stick and knocked off a shoe of the female corpse. Since the toes were painted, she knew it could not have been Maria, since her mother never used nail polish. On December 28th, Juliana's watch finally stopped. After that, she tried to count off the days but suffered from confusion. On the fifth or sixth day of her journey, Juliana heard a sound that gave her hope. It was the call of a hoatzin, a subtropical bird that nests solely near open stretches of water. Figuring that people would be settled by the water, Juliana found the sound, picking up her pace. Finally, Juliana made her way to the bank of a large river, but there were no humans or settlement in sight. Periodically, she heard the sound of planes in the distance, but less and less as the days passed. She despaired, believing that the searchers had given up, having rescued all the passengers except for her. The densely overgrown riverbanks made it hard for Juliana to continue on land. She began to carefully wade through shallow water, keeping a lookout for stingrays. Because it was slow going, Juliana tried to swim in the middle of the river, knowing that stingrays won't venture into deep water. However, she still had piranhas and caimans to worry about. At night, she huddled on the riverbank, restlessly dozing, her various injuries pulsating with pain, her cuts and scrapes infected. Days ago, Juliana had eaten the last piece of her candy. Now she drank river water to keep her stomach full. One morning, she felt a sharp pain in her back. When she gingerly explored the area, her hand came away bloody. The sun had severely burned her back as she swam. An exhausted and starving Juliana was plagued with hallucinations of civilization. Sometimes she saw the roof of a house or heard chickens clucking. She endlessly fantasized about food. Each day it got harder to get into the cold water and swim. On the tenth day of Juliana's arduous journey, she constantly encountered logs as she drifted downriver. She weakly climbed over them, using the last of her strength, trying not to injure herself further. After an exhausting day, Juliana swam to a shore where she dozed off on a gravel bank. Minutes later, she awoke to an amazing sight, a boat. Juliana wanted to leave, but she didn't want to steal the boat. Instead, she took a small path that led up the bank from the river. Because she was so weak, it took her hours to make it up the hill to a tiny hut with a palm leaf roof. At the hut, Juliana found a liter of gasoline. She poured some on her wounds, remembering having seen her father do the same to cure a dog of worms. The gasoline stung, but drew out a mass of maggots that were infecting her arm. A second path led from the hut into the rainforest. Juliana waited, but no one showed up, so she spent the night at the shack. The ground was too hard, so she went back into the water and laid down in the sand. The next day, Juliana walked up to the hut again because it was pouring rain. There were frogs everywhere and Juliana tried to catch one to eat. Thankfully, she was too slow, which was good because the frogs ended up being poisonous. Juliana stayed at the shelter telling herself that she'd rest one more day before moving on. 
Near evening, she heard voices and thought it was her imagination, but then three lumberjacks came out of the forest. They froze in shock when they saw her. Juliana recalls that they thought she was a kind of water goddess called a Yamanja, a figure from a local legend who is a hybrid of a water dolphin and a blonde, white-skinned woman. In Spanish, Juliana explained what happened. The woodcutters treated her wounds and gave her food. The next morning, they loaded her into a canoe for a seven-hour ride downriver to a lumber station. From there, a local pilot flew her to a hospital in Pucallpa. Juliana learned that her collarbone was actually broken. She had torn an ACL and partially fractured her shin. The day after arriving at the hospital, Juliana was reunited with her father. She described their emotional reunion as a moment without words. Juliana was interviewed by the Air Force and police. With her direction, search parties located the crash site and the bodies of the victims. In total, the Lanza Flight 508 crash killed 91 people, 6 crew members and 85 of its 86 passengers. It was discovered that as many as 14 passengers, including Juliana's mother Maria, survived the crash, but perished due to their injuries before they could be found. Juliana was hailed as the miracle girl in the Peruvian press. She received hundreds of letters from all over the world touched by her tale of survival. She and her father moved to Germany, where Juliana made a full recovery. Though plagued by nightmares, grief over her mother's death, and haunted by survivor's guilt, Juliana excelled at college, studying zoology like her parents, and got a PhD. In 2000, famed director Werner Herzog made a documentary about Juliana's ordeal. He actually located the crash site and filmed Juliana retracing some of her steps. In 2011, Juliana published an autobiography. Today, Juliana, now in her 60s, is a librarian at the Bavarian State Collection of Zoology in Germany and frequently visits Panguana, the Peruvian research facility started by her parents. You ever had that nightmare where you're naked and everyone's laughing at you? Well, for mountain man John Coulter, the bad dream was real. The hot summer sun beat down on his unmentionable places as a crowd of Blackfoot Indians made crude gestures and taunted him. They had already killed his partner and now a group of leaders were deciding his fate. Suddenly, an elder grabbed Coulter's arm and led him away. Go, said the elder, pointing at the prairie. Run! Confused, Coulter staggered forward and then glanced back. The Blackfoot warriors were stretching, limbering up. That's when Coulter realized he was running for his life. Late in the summer of 1809, John Coulter and John Potts left Fort Raymond, also known as Fort Manuel, and ventured into Blackfoot territory near where the Gallatin, Jefferson, and Madison Rivers meet. Today, this area is known as Three Forks, Montana. The two men were skilled hunters and planned to trap beavers. They had met a few years before when they had been members of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Coulter and Potts knew that poaching in Blackfoot territory was extremely dangerous, but a good price was being paid for beaver pelts, so they tried to keep their presence on the down low. They set out beaver traps at night, checked them in the early morning, <laughs> hid and slept during midday. The two men were each paddling a small dugout canoe up the Jefferson River when they heard a stamping noise. Coulter worried that it was Blackfoot Indians and wanted to turn back, but Potts insisted the noise was buffalo and accused Coulter of cowardice. For the rest of Potts's very short, miserable life, he wished he had listened to Coulter. They paddled around a bend to see that the banks of the river were lined with around 800 Blackfoot, some on horses. The tribe gestured for them to come ashore. Coulter thought it was best to comply. Trying to escape was futile. He furatively cut the lines for his beaver trapping gear, letting it drift to the shallow bottom of the river. He told Potts that he could retrieve it later. Coulter went ashore. He spoke rudimentary Blackfoot and also a little crow, the language of the neighboring Indian tribe. He thought that he and Potts were just going to be robbed. The Blackfoot took Coulter's gear, his rifle, flint, powder horn, and his knife. Then they made him strip. Off came Coulter's shirt, belt, pants, and boots. Soon he was as naked as the day he was born. Meanwhile, Potts stood in his canoe, long rifle in hand, watching the proceedings and refusing to come ashore. The Blackfoot communicated to Coulter that he should tell Potts to come ashore. Coulter told Potts, but Potts refused, saying that he might as well lose his life rather than be stripped and robbed like Coulter. Prophetic words. An archer on the shore shot Potts in the hip with an arrow. Potts fell to the bottom of his boat. Coulter asked if he was hurt. Potts said, yes, he was hurt, too injured to escape. As he rose up from the bottom of his canoe, poised for action, Potts told Coulter to get away if he could. 
he was going to shoot at least one Indian. Pots fired, killing one Blackfoot. All hell broke loose. A volley of arrows were unleashed at Potts, and in seconds he was dead, riddled with arrows and bullets. Blackfoot jumped in the river and dragged Potts' boat to shore. Raging, they tossed his corpse on the ground. They mutilated his body, hacking it apart with tomahawks and knives. Coulter stood by, head turned away so he didn't see. Some accounts claim that the Blackfoot threw Potts' entrails into Coulter's face to goad him. Either way, soon all that was left of Potts was a bloody, pulpy mess on the ground. An angry warrior came at Coulter with a tomahawk, but his tribesmen grabbed him and held him back. A group of leaders and elders quickly convened to decide what to do with Coulter. Meanwhile, Coulter stood there in his birthday suit, being harassed by the mob. He was sweating, trying to keep a cool head while dreading what was going to happen next. Would the Blackfoot torture him before they killed him? An elder left the council, came over to Coulter, grabbed his arm, and began to walk him away from the crowd. The elder pointed at the prairie. Go! Go away, he told Coulter and Crow. Coulter walked a few steps forward on shaky legs. He thought that the tribe was going to shoot him in the back. The elder impatiently gestured and demanded Coulter go faster. Coulter walked a little faster. When he got maybe 100 yards away, he glanced back to see that the young men of the tribe were stripping off their leggings and stretching. That's when Coulter understood. They were the hunters, and he was the prey. He was running for his life. His heart pounding, Coulter took off, running as fast as he could. Seconds later, blood-curdling cries went up as the Blackfoot came chasing after Coulter. Coulter was fleet of foot, he was in good shape, and adrenaline coursed through his body. But every step was painful. The prairie was treacherous. Large swaths of prickly pear bush covered the ground. The tiny spikes from their stickers pierced the tender skin between Coulter's toes. Pebbles tripped him and also bit into his feet. Shrubs scratched and left welts on his calves as he charged through them. Thankfully, Coulter knew the area. He was about five miles from the Madison River. If he could just make it there. Coulter ran and ran, not daring to look back. Startled birds flew up from the grass as he bolted past. He could hear war whoops and laughter carrying on the breeze. Also, footsteps. He wasn't sure if the Blackfoot were close on his tail or if it was just the imagination of his terrified mind. Finally, Coulter couldn't bear it any longer. He was out of breath. He had a stitch in his side. His nose had started to bleed from the extreme exertion. Slowing down, he looked back. Coulter had run perhaps three miles. Most of the hunters had lost steam and were distant specks on the prairie. However, one graceful runner draped in a blanket and carrying a spear was far ahead of the rest of the pack, maybe around a hundred yards behind Coulter. The distance between them was just shy of an American football field. Coulter took off again. The Blackfoot hunter chased him for another mile, slowly gaining ground, getting closer and closer. Heart racing, lungs burning, ears ringing, Coulter could run no more. He stopped and whirled around, arms spread wide, panting, his feet shredded and his nose gushing blood. Coulter pleaded for his life in Crow. The exhausted warrior didn't hear Coulter or didn't care. He ran closer and then lunged at Coulter with his spear, but stumbled and fell, breaking his spear in two. The tables were turned. Suddenly, it was the Blackfoot warrior on the ground begging for mercy. Coulter snatched up the half of the spear that had the sharp head and impaled the warrior, pinning him to the ground. Coulter worked the broken spear free of the dying man and stole his blanket. Buoyed by a fresh wave of energy, Coulter turned and ran for the river, which was about a mile away. Coulter gained a little extra time as the Blackfoot stopped to check on their fallen tribesmen. The discovery of their comrade's death sent the Indians into new paroxysms of rage and grief. At the bank of the Madison River, Coulter paused to catch his breath and scanned the area. Slightly downstream, he noticed a huge beaver lodge with a mound of brush, sticks, and river debris rising from the water. Coulter plunged into the river, and golly, it was cold. The water came from snowpack melting further upstream. At least it numbed his swollen, bloody feet. Coulter swam to the beaver lodge and dived down to come up under the wall and enter it. Beaver are clever animals, good at construction. Their lodges are often multi-roomed and two-story. The interior made watertight by an intricate weave of twigs, grass, and mud. Coulter secreted himself on the dry second level of the ledge. Just in time, the Blackfoot splashed into the river, searching for Coulter. They stood atop the beaver mound, poked spears into it, and argued about which way Coulter went. Coulter lay inches under them, scarcely breathing, worried that the hunters would fall through or set his hiding place on fire. Thankfully, they didn't. Instead, the Blackfoot spread out to comb the area. 
Several men crossed to the opposite bank to look for him on the other side of the river. Coulter stayed in his hiding place, terrified that they had left someone on watch. The main pack of hunters came back two hours later, angry, having not seen hide nor hair of Coulter on the far side of the river. Finally, the Blackfoot left, returning to their tribe. A shivering Coulter decided to play it safe and stayed put until dark. Then he finally left the beaver lodge and swam many miles downstream. Finally, Coulter emerged from the water, chilled to the bone. All he had was the sharp end of a broken spear and a sodden blanket. No food, no clothing, and no gear. He was hundreds of miles from the nearest fort. Worse yet, an angry Blackfoot tribe was probably monitoring the nearby mountain pass. Sure, going through Bozeman Pass and following the Yellowstone River was the quickest route back to Fort Raymond. However, that route would take Coulter through the heart of Blackfoot country. He didn't want to chance it. Coulter took a long detour which added probably 100 miles to his journey, but it was far safer. Coulter walked about 30 miles east toward the Bridger Mountains. To get over the mountain, he climbed a near vertical peak. Hiking through the snow-capped peaks at the top of the mountains was especially hard as he had only his lone blanket to stay warm. Once over the mountains, Coulter walked across the Great Plains and then through the Montana wilderness. He ate berries, bark, and roots known as prairie turnips, dug up with his hands and the spear point. Eleven days and some 300 miles later, Coulter finally arrived back to Fort Raymond. He was naked, sunburned, covered in insect bites, and emaciated. His feet were swollen and blistered, his eyes were glassy and his beard long and scraggly. Close companions didn't even recognize him. Coulter spent several weeks recuperating from his narrow escape and arduous journey home. Later that winter, Coulter, who was brave, foolish, or insane, or perhaps a bit of all three, headed back into Blackfoot territory. He wanted to retrieve his expensive beaver trapping gear which he had dropped into the river on that terrible summer's day he ended up being hunted. Since it was the dead of winter, Coulter figured he'd be okay. He thought that the Blackfoot would be hunkered down in their camps until spring. Coulter traveled through the Bozeman Pass and reached the Gallatin River. One evening, he was settling down to a nice meal of boiled buffalo meat by his small campfire when his sharp hunter ears detected the telltale sound of twigs snapping. Operating on instinct honed from years of living in the wilderness, Coulter dove down atop his fire, extinguishing it. Muskets cracked and musket balls whined over Coulter's head as he lay in the darkness. Finally, Coulter had enough. He hastily packed up and went back to Fort Raymond, eventually heading east to buy a farm, settle down, and get married. Suddenly, the ship gave a sickening lurch and Poon Lim slammed into the side of a bunk. An ashtray and some other items tumbled after him. He wondered what was going on. The SS Ben Lomond, a British merchant ship, was 13 days out of Cape Town, South Africa, sailing west bound for Paramaribo, Dutch Guiana. It was nearly noon and 24-year-old Lim, as the second steward, had just been about to leave his quarters to go serve lunch. Lim got to his feet. He was walking out the door when a massive explosion rocked the ship, hurling him to the deck. He laid there for a moment. The wind knocked out of him. He could hear the creaking of a boat, the yells of sailors, and the gush of seawater as it poured through a shattered porthole. Comprehension kicked in as the second explosion, even larger than the first, shook the ship. The Ben Lomond had been torpedoed by a German U-boat. Lim scrambled back to his quarters for his bright orange life jacket. The ship pitched and yawed as he put it on and stumbled down the galley. Thick black acrid smoke billowed from the vents. Lim fought his way across the deck to his assigned lifeboat station, but the boat was already gone. All around him, panicked sailors ran every which way. Scalding steam hissed out of the damaged engine room, and he could hear the screams of the trapped firemen. A slick of black oil was spreading across the blue ocean. No doubt about it, the SS Ben Lomond was going down. Lim saw the second mate and some seamen at the bridge station trying to lower a lifeboat. He ran over to help. There was a sudden thunder-like boom. The main bulkhead was collapsing. The second mate yelled at him to tie their life jackets tight and go over the side. The seamen quickly jumped, but Lim froze. He wasn't much of a swimmer, having only learned to dog paddle as a child. The second mate screamed at him to jump or he would be sucked down with the ship. Before Lim could move, the stern plunged and the massive wave of seawater poured onto the ship. Lim was caught in a black whirlpool. The water made his ears pop, ripped off his slippers, and tangled his loose Chinese trousers around his legs. He struggled trying to kick himself free. His lungs ached and his head threatened to explode. Just when he couldn't hold his breath any longer, Lim was suddenly propelled upwards, the buoyancy of his life jacket making him pop on the surface like a cork. Coughing, Lim stared at the scene before him. He couldn't believe it. All that was left of the Ben Lomond was a huge oily stain and a field of floating wreckage. Lim could hear yells from the living, but the glare of the sun on oily water made it difficult to tell which direction they were coming from. Surely someone had made it onto a lifeboat. Lim shouted too, first in Chinese and then in English. Hanging on a broken board, Lim paddled through the debris field. About 100 yards away, he spotted some seamen in a raft, pulling another survivor aboard. 
Lim shouted and tried to swim closer to the raft, but the men didn't respond. A periscope suddenly appeared and Lim was rocked by swells as a U-boat rose to the surface. A hatch opened and submariners swarmed out. They trained guns on the raft and reeled it in. Lim breathlessly watched as the survivors were led into the submarine. Sometimes U-boats would take survivors hostage, but these submariners seemed relaxed. They hung out on deck smoking cigarettes. Lim decided to take a chance and started yelling for help as he paddled toward the submarine. Eventually, the seamen noticed Lim and alerted the others. They beckoned him to come closer. Then Lim saw survivors being forced back onto the raft. The U-boat started up, churning water, creating huge swells which tumbled Lim under. The submariners laughed and aimed their guns, pretending to fire at him. Then they went down the hatch and the U-boat began to dive. Lim closed his eyes, thinking that he was going to be sucked down in another whirlpool, but he wasn't. After a few moments, he opened his eyes to see that the submarine and the raft were gone. The SS Ben Lomond had sunk in two minutes. Only six survivors had managed to abandon the ship. The survivors on the raft were never seen again, ultimately making Lim the lone survivor out of the crew of 54. Despairing, Lim paddled around looking for someone, something, anything. Hours later, he finally saw something. One of the Ben Lomond's emergency rafts. After swimming to the raft and hauling himself onto the narrow deck, Lim was exhausted and collapsed. Sometime later, he awoke, stiff, sore, and shivering. Lim wrestled out of his life jacket and took off his sodden clothing. Worried about getting separated from the raft, he took some rope and made a loop for his wrist so he could keep the raft tied to him. He curled up on a ledge and scanned the darkening horizon, hoping to see the sweep of a spotlight. But there was only waves. It was late morning when Lim awoke, chilly. He reached for his clothing only to realize that it was gone, fallen overboard sometime during the night. However, his life jacket was floating in the water. The buckle snagged on the edge of the raft. He leaned over and grabbed at it, but it was just out of reach. Lim was afraid to stretch further for fear he'd fall overboard. A wave suddenly swept it free and he watched helplessly as the bright orange life jacket drifted away until it was finally out of sight. Lim took stock of the raft. It was square with two eight-foot long, two and a half foot wide plank benches. A three by six well sat between them. The whole frame sat upon six watertight drums. There were two metal containers fore and aft containing supplies. Luckily, the containers were stocked with a bag of barley sugar, two pounds of chocolate, five tins of evaporated milk, tins of hardtack, dried beef, flour, molasses, suet, malted milk tablets, and a bottle of lime juice. More importantly, there was an 11-gallon water tank. There was also loose tobacco and rolling papers in a small tin, matches along with a rope, five flares, two smoke pots, and a flashlight. Lastly, there were oars and a huge canvas sail. Unfortunately for Lim, he knew little about sailing and had no way to navigate. He quickly used the sail to create a shelter so he'd have some relief from the scorching sun. The next several days were all the same. During the day, Lim huddled in the shaded well. Night brought relief from the heat, but then he would shake with chills due to sunburn. Though Lim didn't have much of an appetite, he ground up a little hardtack, mixed it with water to form a thick soup, and sprinkled on some dry beef for flavor. He daydreamed about his childhood in a rural village in the province of Hainan, China. He tried to calculate how long it would take a rescue boat to reach the area where the Ben Lomond went down to find him. A squall blew up and the raft danced on the choppy waves. Lim curled up in the well and gripped the side of a bench so hard he got splinters. Just over a week after the Ben Lomond sank, Lim sighted a ship. It was still far away so he decided to set off a smoke pot to draw it near and then he would set off a flare. The ship didn't react to the smoke and changed course. But Lim decided to set off a flare anyway, but he didn't know how to use them. They had instructions, but Lim didn't read English very well. He tried to light a flare and tossed it in a wide arc. It fell into the sea and sank unlit. In a panic, he dropped the second flare in the sea. But his third attempt worked. A red ball of light shot up into the sky, but the ship didn't change course. Lim set off the fourth flare and the ship swung toward his raft. Lim set off his final flare. The ship came close enough that he could see three men on the bridge and the glint of binoculars. Lim realized the mariners were studying him. Sometimes enemy subs used decoys to lure ships. Lim yelled that he was from the Ben Lomond. He thought about jumping in the water and swimming for it. Suddenly, the ship's engines revved to life. Lim lit a smoke pot, but the ship turned and rapidly sailed out of sight. Lim cursed and wept. He wondered if the ship had refused to pick him up because he was Chinese. The next morning, Lim woke up with a new resolve. There was no guarantee he'd be rescued anytime soon. He needed to make plans to survive. He checked his supplies. He had drank two gallons of water in just over a week. At this rate, his water would last maybe 28 days. However, if he limited himself to a pint a day, drinking in the morning and then again at dusk, he could stretch it to 40 days. He portioned out his food as well. Lim's skin was erupting into painful boils from the constant exposure to salt water. He took the jagged edge of a tin and lanced the bumps. He could no longer sleep in the well. He needed to stay dry and sleep on a bench, even if he risked falling into the sea. He made himself a rough sleeping bag out of some canvas and lashed it to a bench. 
It took several days before Lim got used to napping on the bench, but with his skin staying drier, his boils improved. His biggest problem became thirst. Most days, long before evening, he had drunk all his rationed water. He opened a tin of milk and drank most of it at once because it would rapidly spoil in the heat. It gave him an upset stomach and diarrhea. Lim figured out that he could keep an open tin of milk floating in another tin of seawater in the well to slow the spoiling. When it rained, Lim scrubbed himself and gargled. He developed a system to catch rainwater on the sail so he could replenish the water tank. By now, his skin had tanned to leather and his hair had grown long enough to shield his eyes from the dazzling sun. As his supplies got low, Lim began to try to figure out how to catch fish. He ended up digging the spring out of the flashlight and bending it into a hook. He beat the edge of a tin lid and shaped it to make a knife. The knife went on a lanyard around his neck. After many tries, Lim finally caught his first fish. He ate it raw, even though it was slimy and disgusting. Knowing that fish was his best chance for survival, Lim came up with a system of drying them, thus making them more tasty and preserving them to eat later. Lim had been successfully fishing for about two weeks when a large fish nearly got away with his hook. Lim decided to make a better hook. Using the heavy key to the water tank, Lim started to dig a nail out of one of the planks. For hours he worked at it using the key and his fingernails to chip away at the wood surrounding the nail. Unable to yank the loosened nail out with his hands, eventually he gripped it in his teeth and pulled. The pain was excruciating and Lim's mouth rapidly filled with blood, but all at once the nail yanked free. Lim's head snapped back and he bumped it hard on the bench. Lim had to wait a few days for his hands to heal up before hammering the nail into a hook shape and then filing it into a fine point. In all, the making of the new hook took about a week in which he barely ate, but afterwards he was able to catch larger fish. Lim developed a routine where he fished early in the morning, cleaned the fish and prepared them for drying, ate and spent the rest of the afternoon in the shade of the canvas. Sometimes he sang songs from his childhood as he worked. He was able to preserve and store up a few days worth of fish. At first, Lim counted the days by tying knots in a rope, but after a long while he decided that there was no point in counting the days and began counting full moons. It was several days later that Lim spotted six planes flying in formation. He had seen planes before, but this time he was ready. He waved the crude flag he had made with a length of canvas and an oar. A plane broke formation to take a closer look. Lim yelled and waved the oar madly. The plane circled the raft. Lim had been seen. The plane dropped a buoy and waggled its wings before flying off. Lim sat with hope and caution warring inside him. How long before the plane came back? As afternoon turned into evening, Lim became worried. Low dark clouds hung in the sky. A big storm was coming. Soon the wind howled. Angry streaks of lightning split the sky. Surging waves rushed over the raft, sending Lim sputtering. All he could do was wrap himself in the canvas sail, huddle in the well, and hold onto a plank as best he could. Lim wasn't exactly sure for how long the storm raged, but it was for days. When the sea finally quieted, he crawled out of the well, weak and bruised. Worst yet, the storm had destroyed his supplies. His food was spoiled or washed away. The water tank befouled with seawater. By strength of will, Lim bailed out the water tank, spread the canvas to dry, and completed other cleanup tasks. For a couple days, Lim tried to fish baiting the hook with barnacle meat, but caught nothing. His genitals began to swell, and it was hard to pee. When Lim finally urinated, he drank the pee. Unfortunately, it only eased his thirst briefly. Lim would repeat the action a few times over the next week, his urine growing darker and darker. Then one day, he couldn't go anymore. He was so thirsty, his skin was flaking off. The saltwater boils were back and they broke open on their own and oozed pus. The inside of his mouth was full of ulcers and foul white fur coated his tongue. Lying down was uncomfortable as he could feel every inch of his protruding bones touching the planks. He was dying. There was no way around it. Lim drifted in and out of consciousness, pinching himself to stay awake. He felt that if he slept, he wouldn't wake up. Day turned into night. A gentle breeze blew over his feverish skin. Lim kept his eyes half closed against the searing brightness of the moon. He heard the flap of wings overhead. Then a bird landed on the raft to investigate him. Lim held his breath as the bird hopped closer, closer. When it was less than a foot from his hand, Lim pounced. He had it by the legs. The bird shrieked and beat its wings, but Lim banged its head against the deck until it was silent. With his knife, Lim slot a slit in the feathered breast and drank the still warm blood. Then he tore apart the bird and ate it raw. For the first time in a few days, he slept. The next day, it drizzled and Lim was able to catch a little water. That night, Lim caught another bird and devoured it like the first. He awoke to rain. Lim drank deeply. It was too much water too soon and he vomited. After that, he took smaller sips and was fine. He set up his water catch system and was able to capture several gallons of water. Not long after that, Lim realized that he had drifted into waters full of fish. He was able to catch some. He had to force himself to eat slowly. Over the next several days, Lim grew stronger. He alternated between catching fish and birds. His health slowly improved. One day while fishing, Lim reeled in part of a tree trunk. It was the first sign of land he'd seen in months. Within a few days, the ocean water had turned muddy brown. It obviously mingled with fresh water somewhere nearby. 
In the distance, Lim could see a strip of sandy beach. As Lim drifted closer, he could see a jungle and smell the vegetation. He tried to use an oar to row towards the land, but the current was too strong, so he drifted parallel. One misty morning, Lim could hardly believe his eyes. A fleet of fishing boats were sailing fairly close by in search of an early catch. Lim began to shout for help in English, his voice rusty from disuse. Poon Lim was rescued by a fishing family 10 miles off the coast of Brazil. He sailed with them for three days before they landed at Belém. He spent 133 days at sea. He was weak but able to walk ashore unassisted. The amazed British consul took photos of Lim and sent him to a hospital. He was 30 pounds underweight, but surprisingly he had no serious problems. He spent 45 days in the hospital recovering. Eventually Lim returned to Britain. King George VI bestowed a British Empire medal on him, and the Royal Navy incorporated his tale into manuals of survival techniques. After World War II ended, Lim wanted to emigrate to the United States, but the quota for Chinese immigrants had been reached. However, because of his fame and special legislation written by Senator Warren Magnuson, he received a special dispensation and eventually gained citizenship. The U.S. Navy Emergency Rescue Equipment Section interviewed Lim extensively, even reconstructing a raft similar to the one Lim survived on. Lim reenacted his survival skills and showed them his technique for making a knife. When told no one had ever survived on a raft longer at sea, Lim is said to have replied, I hope no one will ever have to break the record. When you're in 5th or 6th grade, you have a lot on your mind. There's that upcoming math test, what to say to the cute girl sitting next to you, or that after-school sports game you'll be playing in. Life can be a bit challenging at times, even under normal circumstances. But for Norman Allistead Jr., he had an additional problem. He had to figure out how to navigate an 8,600-foot-tall mountain in freezing temperatures, all by himself. Now that's what you could call an unsettling situation. So you might be thinking a circumstance like that is absolutely insane for an 11-year-old kid, and it is, without a doubt. But what's different about Norman from your regular middle schooler is that he had been preparing for this moment all his life. Unintentionally, of course. But because of his childhood upbringing, there was pretty much no extreme challenge Norman wouldn't at least have a fighting chance to survive. This was all thanks to his father, although at times, Norman didn't exactly feel gratitude. His father, the senior Norman Allestead, was what you might call a daredevil. Some would say he lived his life to the fullest, while others might see him as a bit crazy. An actor, athlete, musician, lawyer, and at one point even an FBI agent, there was nothing it seemed he wouldn't or couldn't do if he wanted to. That included some extreme pastimes. He lived in the prime of the California surfing culture and he embraced it with all he had as well as things like skiing the sheer slopes of exceptionally tall mountains. And he brought his son into it as well, and from the time he was barely walking. There's a picture of him with Norman Jr. as a one-year-old toddler strapped to his back as he stands riding a wave in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's the kind of environment Norman Jr. grew up in, the kind where one wrong move could be your last one. As he grew from a tot to a young boy in Malibu, California, his father threw him fully into the sports of both skiing and surfing but not as a typical father would approach them. Instead, Norman Jr. was skiing steep black diamond type slopes as well as riding raging waves along the Mexican coast. He was dubbed a boy wonder because of all he had done under the strong insistence of his father. While it's important to remember parenting wasn't quite the same in the 70s or 80s as it is today, this was still quite unusual even back then. And today, many of the things his father did may have landed him in jail. Things have changed in this area. But while Norman Jr. did admit he'd rather have been out riding his bicycle or snacking on cake from time to time, he also called his many adventures really beautiful, and they made unforgettable memories he would cherish for the rest of his life. More than that, the skills he learned gave him a chance at survival when he was later stuck in the middle of nowhere 50 miles from Los Angeles, on the top of the San Gabriel Mountains thousands of feet above the ground in a blizzard in February. But what was he doing on the mountain to begin with, you might be wondering? It all started at around 8 a.m. on February 19th of 1979. Norman Allstead Jr., his father and his father's girlfriend were flown via a single-engine Cessna 172 through mountainous territory en route to the mountain town of Big Bear to get a trophy he had won for a skiing competition. Along the way, the weather got unfriendly and suddenly everything turned gray. Clouds appeared all around the windows of the plane, pressing in on them. They could see nothing except an occasional object pop out here and there, and then again vanishing. Too late, they realized what they were, the limbs of trees. Soon the plane struck one and crashed along the mountainside, instantly killing the pilot and Norman Jr.'s father, and seriously wounding his father's girlfriend. Norman Jr. remembers three thuds as he made contact with the solid mountain. The third knocked him out. 
He doesn't know exactly how long he was passed out, but he awoke in excruciatingly cold temperatures. To make matters worse, his hand was broken. He found his dad and tried to get him to wake up, but he was unresponsive. Afraid of freezing to death, he and Sandra Cressman, his father's 30-year-old girlfriend, sat together under the wing of the plane in a desperate attempt to get warm. They waited and waited for hours until after seven had passed, they became worried that they could die before they were found. So they did the only thing left to do, they attempted to navigate down the mountain. Snow and ice were so deep that they reached Norman's waist, so he grabbed the stick and slid down on his bottom, thrusting the stick in the snow when he began to move too fast for comfort. With the long distance between him and safety, it was painfully slow going. Unfortunately, Sandra was not as adept at icy travel. She also had a deep cut on her forehead and a dislocated arm which definitely didn't help her situation. Despite Norma's attempts to help her down the mountain, she ended up falling in a particularly icy area. She never got back up again. As Norma described her, though she could open her eyes, she seemed to be so badly hurt that she can no longer talk. Her body was discovered later by a rescue team prone on the mountainside, 100 yards from the scene of the crash. Norman kept going. As he moved on, he heard a helicopter above him. He stood up and waved at it and thought they had seen him, but he was wrong. They flew on and left him alone, still stuck on the mountain. However, he pushed on. As his father had taught him throughout his youth, when the going gets tough, you just keep on going. So that's what he did. Giving up was never an option. He said he felt instinct take over and became an animal, similar to a wolf, an animal fully at home in the treacherous wilderness. Norman traveled two miles from the plane to safety on the ground by alternating stopping and sliding. He used the skills he had perfected through his extensive surfing and skiing experience to know the right angle to turn and how to best glide. He had complete control of his body and could pull off the moves necessary to get through particularly dangerous areas. He almost felt at home, as he put it, a 45 degree pitch in blizzard with slippery ice was nothing unlike what he had done for the last 8 years of his life. He was much more than prepared, even when it came to scaling a vertical gulch of stone using only his fingers. Still, it took him 9 hours to make it down. He then walked along a creek to a ranch house. A rescue party arrived on the mountain only after the clouds shrouding it had lifted. There, they saw the plane wreck and the three lifeless bodies resting on it. Norman Jr. was the only one who survived, and though he had a broken hand and a swollen face due to many cuts he sustained during the journey, he claimed to only be a little sore. In a wheelchair the day after the ordeal, he explained what had happened while his mother sat next to him. His parents were divorced by that time and Norman had questionable thoughts about the boyfriend she dated afterward, but he was beyond happy to be back with his remaining family. Later, Norman wrote a book about his experiences. Many would say it was mostly a book about his father and their at times strained and at other times magical relationship. As Norman put it, both were inextricably linked. He said that relationship was with him on that mountain, despite the fact that his father was already dead. The book, titled Crazy for the Storm, A Memoir of Survival, was a great success and lauded by critics. The picture on the book's jacket is him as a small child strapped onto his father's back as he rides a wave in the middle of the ocean. Norman Jr. wrote the epilogue to his own son, who he has raised responsibly yet in a way that he still learns crucial lessons in life, and the response from readers has been overwhelming. Norman has received numerous letters and emails from his readers talking about their own experiences with their mothers and fathers. Many seem to feel something deep and personal through Norman's story that resonates with their own lives. In the wake of a tragic disaster, many have come together to revisit their childhood. Two and a half minutes. It's June 29, 1966, and for months the prisoners have watched the guards. They've noted details, memorized routines, and made maps of the POW camp using pebbles. Now it's all down to Dieter. Two and a half minutes is all the time he has before the guards return from retrieving their evening meal from the kitchen hut. A prisoner acting as lookout flashes Dieter the go signal. He yanks the pre-loosened logs up from the floor of his hut and squeezes through a small opening. He crawls through the secret tunnel under the fence surrounding the prisoner huts. He sneaks into a guard shack where he quickly snatches a couple rifles. By now, other prisoners are escaping. Dieter hands out the rifles and the prisoners scatter. Angry yells from the direction of the kitchen hut. The guards have realized that an escape is underway. They scramble toward Dieter. One shoots, sending a bullet whizzing just over Dieter's head. He fires back and drops the guard, but he's outnumbered. The swarm of enraged guards closing in. No way can Dieter shoot them all. As a young boy in Germany, Dieter Dangler witnessed Allied bombings of his village and decided that he was going to be a fighter pilot when he grew up. After a long slew of immigrating to the US, enduring a stint in the US Air Force, college, and graduating from the US Navy Aviation Cadet Program, Dieter finally became a pilot. 
He then underwent further instruction training as an attack pilot to fly the Douglas AD Sky Raider. After training, Dieter was stationed aboard the aircraft carrier USS Ranger off the coast of Vietnam. It was here that he joined an ill-fated secret operation that would result in him becoming a POW. On February 1, 1966, just after 9 a.m., four Sky Raiders take off from the USS Ranger. They fly in formation at 10,000 feet on a classified mission to bomb targets in North Vietnam. When Dieter reaches the target, an anti-aircraft battery, he drops ordnance. The air defense system fires back, blasting the right wing of his plane with a 75mm shell. A second shell hits his engine. It sputters and dies. Mayday! Mayday! Dieter shouts into his radio as he begins to fall out of the sky. He makes a split-second decision not to parachute, worrying that he'll be an easy target for hostiles to shoot down. Thankfully, Dieter is able to guide his damaged plane toward a clearing in the jungle. As he plummets, he tosses flight charts, authenticator codes, and other classified material out of the cockpit so they won't be found. The plane hits a couple of trees and breaks apart. Dieter tumbles about the cockpit as the fuselage cartwheels several times. His helmet is yanked from his head, and a large piece of broken glass from the windscreen slams into his skull. Dieter wakes up in his cockpit about 100 feet from the rest of his wreckage. His head's bleeding, he has a concussion, he's banged up, and a huge purple bruise is blooming on his left knee. However, he still has on his survival vest and waist pack. Dieter starts to crawl. The crash made a thunderous racket. He knows he has to get away before anyone shows up. Eventually, he gets to his feet. He stumbles through the jungle until he's maybe half a mile from the crash site. Dieter then inspects his wounds. He bandages his knee and cleans his bleeding head as best he can, removing a large shard of glass. He inspects his compass and considers heading west towards Thailand, which is a US ally, but then again, that's what the enemy would expect him to do. Dieter decides to go north toward the Mekong River, which he estimates is some 30 miles away. If he isn't rescued after a few days, he'll head toward Thailand. For the next several hours, Dieter wanders through the jungle evading other humans. At night, he tries to bunk down in his sleeping bag but hardly gets any rest as he's attacked by countless mosquitoes and other insects. The next day, Dieter tries to signal planes flying overhead but they don't see him. Dieter continues his march through the jungle but makes a huge error. He ignores the traditional survival advice to avoid trails and watering holes because that's where he'd be most likely to run into other humans. Exhausted from hacking through the brush, Dieter walks on an established path. Unfortunately, he runs right into some Patet Lao troops, pro-communist Laotians. They immediately take him hostage. They tie Dieter's hands with rope and search him, taking his watch, compass, and going through his rucksack. He chatters at them in German, hoping to convince them that he's German, not a US soldier, but they just seem confused. That night, the guards drive big stakes into the ground and spread eagle Dieter between them. Tied up, Dieter can't even prevent leeches crawling up his legs. The next few days are a blur. Dieter is marched through the jungle at a punishing pace and tied up every night. His guards feed him poorly cooked sticky rice and he drinks unfiltered river water. Eventually, Dieter's original captors hand him off to a guerrilla group and he ends up in a village where a province chief speaks fluent French. Dieter speaks some French and is glad to be able to communicate. The chief spends hours talking to Dieter about the places he's visited in Europe. He makes sure that Dieter is treated well. For the first time in about a week, Dieter gets a full meal. He's allowed to bathe and his various injuries are treated. At night, he's allowed to sleep on a mat without being tied up. But then the chief demands that Dieter sign a document stating that the US is deliberately bombing women and children, and although Dieter disagrees with the policy, he's forced to fly these missions by the US government. When Dieter refuses to sign, the chief turns him over to some guards. They beat Dieter until he blacks out. Dieter is revived when the guards splash water on him. They tie him to a water buffalo and whip it into a trot. Dieter is dragged throughout the village, much to the merriment of the crowd. His clothes and skin shred. Dieter is given a second chance to sign the document condemning the US's actions, but still refuses. At dawn, the guerrillas leave, taking Dieter with him. Again, Dieter spends a long day marching through the jungle. At night, Dieter manages to escape and hides on a hilltop, but as the sun rises, Dieter becomes extremely thirsty. He cuts up a succulent and tries drinking its liquid, but the plant is poisonous. Dieter's cheeks go numb and his throat swells shut. Desperate, Dieter stumbles down the cliff, drinking at a watering hole when the Patet Lao catch him. Angry that he escaped, the guerrillas torture him. They twist his arms and hang him upside down from a tree. They beat him. They smear honey on Dieter's face and position a nest of black stinging ants under him. Dieter drifts in and out of consciousness. At night, Dieter is lowered into a small cave full of water. He spends the night numb, shivering in the cold. The guerrillas hand Dieter over to some North Vietnamese soldiers who march him to a POW camp. It's February 14th, and it's only been 14 days since Dieter crashed. 
The primitive POW camp is run by a different group of Patet Lao. The guards imprison Dieter in a tiny, rickety prisoner hut filled with spider's nests. The hut is dark and hot, lights get in through cracks and a few slats in the door. After the guards leave, prisoners in the hut next door whisper to Dieter. There are six other prisoners, pilot Duane Martin, air crew Jean De Bruin, Chinese radio operator Tu Yik Chu, nicknamed YC, and three Thai cargo shippers, Prasit Thani, Prasit from Suan, and Pisidi Indradat. Dieter is stunned to learn that two of the prisoners had been imprisoned for over two years. Some of the POWs have tried to escape before but were recaptured and severely punished. Dieter tells them that he's going to escape as soon as possible, but the others advise Dieter to wait for the monsoon season which generally starts in May. He'll be harder to track in the rain and fresh water will be easier to come by. Dieter soon settles into a grim routine. Days are spent mainly in the fetid huts. Prisoners are briefly let out to use the latrine and have a little fresh air. Periodically, the guards take a prisoner to the North Vietnamese soldiers for interrogation. Prasit Thani, who speaks Laotian, Vietnamese, and English, acts as a translator. The guards use any pretext to viciously beat the prisoners. They often play cruel mind games such as suddenly firing guns without ammo at the prisoners to see them flinch. The POWs keep up their spirits by having discussions at night regarding history, religion, etc. Dieter makes a chess set out of bamboo and rocks and teaches the other prisoners how to play. Each evening, the guards lock each prisoner into wooden foot blocks so they can't escape while the guards sleep. The prisoners fashion makeshift keys which they keep hidden in their underwear, knowing that the guards won't search there. Every night, they secretly unlock themselves and only get back to their restraints at dawn before the guards wake up. The prisoners' meals are small portions of rice. Dieter secretly begins to dry out and hide rice to prepare for escape. Not long after Dieter arrives, the prisoners are moved to a newly built POW compound several miles from the old one. The new compound is hidden deeper in the jungle and is even harder to see from the air. A 15-foot woven bamboo fence encircles the camp. There's a single guarded gate which opens to a dirt path. Outside the fence at both ends of the compound are 30-foot guard towers that are overlooking the yard. Also outside the fence are several guard huts and a kitchen hut as well as a camp latrine. A small stream trickles nearby. In the stockade are two elevated log and bamboo prisoner huts with thatched, leaf-covered roofs. Each is about 18 feet long and 6 feet wide. The guards split the prisoners into two groups, the three Americans in one hut and three Thai prisoners in YC in the other. The arrangement actually helps to lessen tension between the prisoners. As of late, the Americans have been suspicious about Prasit talking to the guards behind their back. The prisoners quickly slip back into their normal, monotonous routine. Each morning, the prisoners are woken up early and get a trip to the latrine. Around 9 a.m., they're given rice for a quick breakfast and afterwards return to their huts. In the evening, they are again given rice. Months go by. The rains do not come. By mid-June, a famine is growing. The gorillas are no longer able to get rice from nearby villages. They start catching rats, tadpoles, and wild pigs for food. Of course, the prisoners are fed the worst parts of the animals. Over several days, Dieter secretly weakens the flooring of his hut by pouring water and urine around the support pole. He also slowly digs a hole under the stockade. He and the other prisoners note routines and work out details of an escape plan. Day by day, the prisoners grow weaker. They endure lack of food but also suffer from malaria, parasites, and bouts of dysentery. Ten of the seventeen guards go on a longer trip to faraway villages seeking food. Only seven guards are left at the POW camp. Seven prisoners, seven guards. It's the best opportunity they're gonna get. But there's a hitch in the plans. YC has fallen extremely ill and can't walk. Gene refuses to leave his friend behind. The American POWs decide to take over the camp and signal a plane instead of escaping. 4 p.m. The guards go get their dinner from the kitchen hut. When Prasit Thani, who's acting as a lookout, gives the signal, Dieter springs into action. He pulls up the loose section of his hut's floor and squeezes through, then crawls under the fence. He creeps into the nearest guard hut and grabs three rifles. By this time, other prisoners have also squeezed through the hut floor and crawled out from under the fence. Dieter gives two of the Thai prisoners guns, the three of them run into the jungle. The guards realize that something's wrong and run out of the kitchen hut. They fire at Dieter, who shoots back, killing one of them. Another guard runs at Dieter with a machete and Dieter kills him point blank. Gene's gotten a machine gun. He helps Dieter drop a third guard. But a few guards escape into the jungle, forcing the POWs to abandon their plan of taking over the camp. If the guards show up with reinforcements, they'll be toast. Dieter and Dwayne say an emotional hasty goodbye to Gene, who's decided to stay behind with YC before plunging into the jungle. They hike until they reach a ridge not far from the stockade. They're dizzy and vomiting from the sudden exertion, but they're free. Exhausted, they make camp. 
They wake to rain. The monsoons have finally arrived. Dieter and Duane continue to hike through the jungle for the next few days. The constant rain makes their travels worse. There are endless mosquitoes and thick, sticky mud. The rice they had carefully dried gets moldy from the rain. They eat it anyway. Their blistered feet grow raw and get infected. They follow a creek. Wherever possible, they walk in the water so they don't leave footprints. The sun briefly comes out and Dieter is able to make a quick directional compass. Luckily, the creek they're following is meandering in the right direction, west toward Thailand. At night, they huddle together for warmth. Reaching a steep mountainous area where the creek turns into a river, Dieter and Duane decide to build a raft and float down the river. The raft works and their plan is going well. That is, until they suddenly hear the roar of a waterfall. They abandon the raft and swim for it, lest they be swept over the falls. They start to run low on rice and have dizzy spells. They manage to kill a large iguana and gorge themselves on the stringy raw meat. They spend a single night in an abandoned village. Though the place is dry, they dare not stay longer. They keep hiking mainly through sheer force of will. A few times, they see planes and try to signal them. They crisscross the river a few times to avoid steep spots or impenetrable bush. Duane, however, is getting weaker and weaker. While he rests in a hidden makeshift camp, Dieter climbs to the top of a nearby ridge. When he has a vantage point, he realizes a horrible truth. They've been walking in a circle. Nearby is the river and he can see the abandoned village where they spent the night a few days ago. Duane and Dieter are demoralized. That night, Duane begins to shiver violently. He's experiencing a bad malaria attack. While Duane tries to rest, Dieter takes apart some of the ammo from his rifle and manages to build a fire. He signals a helicopter and it seems to circle before flying away. Dieter's elated, someone will be back to rescue them shortly, but the helicopter never returns. Sick and starving, Duane and Dieter cautiously approach a nearby village for help, holding out their hands to show they are empty, but a villager brandishing a machete attacks them. He decapitates Duane. Horrified, Dieter manages to escape and hide in the jungle. The villagers spend a few hours hunting him before most of them give up. Dieter goes to the abandoned village and sets it on fire. He doesn't care if it alerts the Patet Lao or the villagers, he just wants a plane to see. The pilot of a C-10 does see it and curiously circles, but Dieter realizes they have no way to know that an American set the blaze. The plane drops some aerial flares and something attached to a small white parachute. Dieter finds the parachute canopy, but not what was attached to it. On a hill near the burnt-out village, Dieter uses the parachute to make an SOS. The next day, a troop of Patet Lao track Dieter via his footprints. Dieter follows them unseen at a safe distance. He's able to glean a little food from the campsite where they stop for lunch. Dizzy, Dieter hunkers down in some bushes and sleeps. The next morning, Dieter has trouble walking and fades in and out of consciousness. A black bear begins to follow Dieter, not attacking, but just waiting. Dieter crosses the river to evade the bear and sees a snake sunning itself on a rock. Without wondering if it's poisonous, Dieter catches the snake. Holding it taut between his two hands, he bites into it while it's still alive. Dieter's digesting his meal and falling asleep in the sun when he hears the sound of a Sky Raider flying low. He leaps up and waves some cloth. The plane circles and the pilot sees Dieter's SOS sign. It's July 20th, 1966. Dieter has been missing nearly six months. He's rescued just about 100 miles from where he originally crashed. Dieter has two types of malaria, intestinal worms, fungus, jaundice, and hepatitis. He's incredibly malnourished and weighs only 98 pounds. Eventually, after over two months in the hospital, Dieter makes a full recovery. It takes him much longer to stop having flashback nightmares about the prison camp. Sadly, out of the seven prisoners, only Dieter and one other are definitively known to have survived. Once in the jungle, Prishadi splits from the Prasits. 32 days of wandering through the jungle later due to hunger, Prishadi faints on a road. He wakes up in captivity. A Lao villager finds him while he was unconscious. Prishadi ends up in Ban Nad in prison, which is later raided by the US on January 7, 1967. In fact, it's the only successful rescue of POWs during the Vietnam War. The two Prasits are never heard from again. Neither are Jean and YC. However, in the spring of 1971, there's a CIA report with testimony from villagers claiming that Jean was again captured and sent to a camp where he was interrogated by English-speaking high-level North Vietnamese Army generals. Jean was last seen in January 1968, nearly two years after the escape. Upper-level CIA are skeptical of the report, but Jean's brother travels to Laos in 1972 seeking further information. Unfortunately, his trip isn't successful. Dieter's rescue is kept secret until he's fully debriefed and it's understood that he never signed any confessions. He receives the Navy Cross, one of America's highest military honors. Once word gets out, Dieter is a national hero. He's surprised by all the attention he receives, and he thinks anyone would have tried that hard to return home. 
A popular tourist destination is Hawaii's Volcanoes National Park. In 2017, some 2 million people visited the park to see formations caused by the volcano Kilauea and other natural wonders. Kilauea is the epitome of the beautiful yet dangerous power of the Earth. This volcano has erupted almost continuously for the last 35 years, from 1983 to 2018. It's the most active of the five volcanoes that formed the Big Island of Hawaii. The volcano's 4,090-foot summit long ago collapsed to form a 3-mile-long and 2-mile-wide caldera. At the stunning steaming bluff overlook on the edge of the caldera, groundwater seeps through large cracks in the earth onto hot volcanic rocks and is transformed into steam. On the evening of Wednesday, May 1, 2019, an unnamed soldier who had traveled to the Big Island for training exercises visited the park, presumably to enjoy nature like any other of the tourists. While at Steaming Bluff, he made a questionable decision. It was probably a spur-of-the-moment idea to climb over the protective metal guardrail meant to keep visitors from the edge of the crater, but ultimately it had life-changing implications. Once on the other side of the railing, the man got closer to the bluff edge to get a better view, but the ground began to crumble beneath his feet. He lost his footing and fell from a 300-foot cliff. Thankfully, there was no lava present when the man fell. However, the floor of the caldera was still extremely hot. Temperatures can reach in excess of 2,140 degrees Fahrenheit. So what would happen if you fell into the lake of lava? Well, technically, if you're standing on the edge of a volcano and fall down into the crater, you're falling into a lake of magma, not lava. Magma is molten rock below the crust of the Earth. Lava is the magma pushed above the surface, usually through volcanic eruption. Yes, we realize that you won't care what it's called if you happen to fall into a pool of molten rock, but for all intents and purposes, we'll call it lava from here on out. Given lava's high density and resistance to flow, most likely you would splat onto the surface of the lava pit and float rather than sink deep into it. Lava is two to three times denser than water and the human body. Also, it's extremely viscous. However, the greater height you fall from, the more deeply you would penetrate the lava. Of course, you would die a rapid, painful death. Possibly, you'd simply burst into flames and burn to death. Fresh lava can range from temperatures of 1300 degrees Fahrenheit to 2200 degrees Fahrenheit, over four times as hot as the broiler settings on most ovens. Cooler lava may run 600 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperature of the lava would help determine how quickly you expire. Instantly, the lava would begin to give you full thickness burns. This means your epidermis would quickly break down and begin to disintegrate. Your underlying skin layers would lose all their water and basically turn to jerky. At the same time, your subcutaneous fat would melt and bubble off. Your blood vessels would rupture soon afterwards, causing rapid blood loss. Gradually, you would be fully consumed, including your bones, and melt away into nothing. Or the radiant heat might kill you before you even hit the lava. There's also a chance you might asphyxiate or sear your lungs due to the hot air and gases above the surface of the lake, pass out, go into a coma, and die. Also, hitting a super dense substance at a high speed could crack your head open and shatter your bones. When the man fell into the caldera around 6.30 p.m., a horrified eyewitness notified authorities. A search and rescue operation immediately got underway with around 25 responders forming small search parties to scour the area. After around three hours of searching at about 9.40 p.m., the rescuers located the man. Miraculously, he had plummeted only 70 feet and landed on a narrow ledge jutting out of the cliff instead of falling to the floor of the crater. He was severely hurt but still alive. Though nightfall and windy conditions made the high-angle rescue challenging, the rescuers were up to the task. They rappelled down the cliffs of the caldera, secured the man onto a stoke stretcher, and airlifted him out with the help of a military helicopter. He was flown to the Hilo Medical Center in critical condition. The next day, the man was upgraded to stable condition, but had a long road to recovery ahead of him. There's a killer in the deserts and coastlines of the United States, and if you're not careful, you'll disappear with just one wrong step and be lost forever. Lake Michigan 2013 Six-year-old Nathan Wester and his family are enjoying the surf and sun in the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore, a popular getaway for local families. For thousands of years, the winds and waves of Lake Michigan have steadily deposited a rising landscape of sand dunes, making the place look more like the Saharan Desert location than the shore of one of America's most famous Great Lakes. The most impressive feature, though, is the steep 126-foot Mount Baldy, a massive sand dune that towers above all the rest. As families and their children play all along its edges and try to summit the mini mountain of sand, they have no idea that a deadly booby trap has been laying in wait for centuries. Long, long ago, this stretch of shore was covered with trees, much like the rest of Lake Michigan. When the sand began to pile up, though, it slowly choked the trees to death. 
one particularly massive tree held on longer than the rest, until it too succumbed to the rising sand. After an untold number of years, the tree was completely covered by the massive sand dune, and the wood within rotted away from the lakeside moisture seeping through the sand. What remained in its place is a massive cavity with a small cap of sand atop it, a perfect trap waiting to be sprung, a trap that would wait centuries before claiming its victim. Little Nathan and his father Greg joined family friend Keith Carrow and his son Colin on an impromptu climb to the top of Mount Baldy. The boys rush ahead as little boys do and begin to eagerly chase each other up the massive sand dune. Neither of the fathers are on guard, they have nothing to fear. Families have been playing here for decades after all, and what danger could a massive sand dune possibly hold after all? They let the boys rush up ahead of them chatting amongst themselves as they slowly follow suit. The perfect day on the beach is about to take a horrifying turn. Nathan and Colin play fight as they run up the sand dune and then suddenly Nathan vanishes right in front of Colin's eyes. After all these years, Nathan has finally managed to do it. He's triggered the deadly booby trap of Mount Baldy. One wrong step and Nathan vanishes in a plume of sand, leaving behind only a small hole. Colin can't believe his eyes and then in a panic rushes down the dune, yelling out that Nathan has vanished. The fathers are confused, but they look up to where Colin is pointing and see the impression left in the sand. He fell in this hole, shouts Colin. Cold terror grips them. The men begin to pound up the sand dune, reaching the hole seconds later. The men try to look down into the hole, but all they see is darkness. They call out to Nathan and hear a muffled reply, I'm scared. They reach their arms down into the hole but feel nothing but empty air. In a growing panic, the men begin to look around for rope or driftwood, literally anything they can use to reach down into the cavity, but there's nothing around them except sand dunes. The men now start to dig desperately, shoving away handfuls of very loose sand. This isn't like the regular sand, years of wear by wind and waves have made it very fine and smooth, causing friction to barely hold it together. As the men dig, more of the sand slips down the sides and into the hole. Now the men realize that they run the risk of burying Nathan alive and try to widen the hole to lessen how much sand slides back in. It's no use though, the men must dig to reach Nathan trapped somewhere in the darkness below them, but digging only means more sand gets poured down the same hole, sand that's slowly starting to cover up the trapped Nathan, who's stuck in the heart of this mountain of sand. Then their worst nightmare happens. The sand dune suffers a catastrophic collapse. In an instant, tons of sand rush into the hole, completely burying Nathan with a final whimper. There's barely an indentation left on the face of the dune to signal where Nathan's been lost or where the men have been furiously digging. The two fathers are dumbfounded, then quickly recover and begin once more to furiously dig. Meanwhile, Colin has run down the dune and found Nathan's mother, Faith, running in a blind panic. Faith doesn't understand what Colin's telling her, but she knows that something is seriously wrong. She rushes up to the sand dune and discovers Keith and Greg digging. She understands exactly what's going on long before Greg comes running toward her to tell her that the sands have swallowed up Nathan. 911 is called. Dispatchers are baffled. She dispatches the fire department, but it's going to be a long time before they can get there. In the meantime, the three dig, now joined by Keith's wife. It's no use though. The more they dig, the more they disturb the sand dune, causing sand to slide down from the top of the dune and undo all of their hard work. They've been at it for 15 minutes now and barely made a hole more than a few inches deep. Police, firefighters, and paramedics begin to show up. There's confusion. Nobody's sure exactly what's going on. Some of the first responders have rope, assuming that the boy simply fell into a hole. They're horrified to discover that Nathan hasn't just fallen into a hole. He's fallen straight into the heart of Mount Baldy and been swallowed alive by sand. Well, alive is a relative term by now. It's been half an hour since Nathan's been buried by tons of sand. Nobody on the scene says it, but everyone's thinking it. Nathan is likely gone by now. Still, the police, EMS, and firefighters join the effort, furiously digging by hand and refusing to give up on Nathan. Faith begins to pray, asking God to give Nathan an air pocket to survive in. Others join her, praying through gritted teeth as they try to move several tons of sand with nothing but their bare hands and brute determination. Finally, an hour after Nathan was buried alive, firefighters with shovels begin to show up. The men work in shifts, furiously digging into the massive sand dune. To avoid having the sand pour in and erase all their work, they widen the hole, but it's of little use. Another hour has gone by and the men have barely dug five feet. There's no sign of Nathan anywhere. Still, nobody wants to believe it, but everyone knows it. They're now officially looking for a body. That doesn't stop or slow their efforts, though, and the emergency personnel throw themselves the task of digging with everything they've got. Faith continues praying, just one miracle, just one miracle, and she'll never ask for anything more again. It's been over two hours and finally some heavy equipment has made it on scene. An excavator has arrived and begins to make its trek up the sand dunes. The powerful machine digs its treads into the sand as the incline rises steeply, 
but even its powerful engine is no match for the loose sand. With hearts sinking in their chests, the rescuers and Nathan's friends and family watch as the excavator is forced to turn back. It'll be of no use here. Nevertheless, the men continue to dig, even though they're getting demoralized by the sand continuing to rush into the hole. It's three steps forward and two steps back. Sometimes though the sand is particularly cruel, and on those occasions it's five steps back, as hundreds of pounds of sand rushes to fill the hole made by the rescue effort. Now a tracked backhoe appears, a little lighter and more agile than the big excavator. However, the sand makes it impossible for the machine to get to the top, its tread slipping and sliding on the infuriatingly loose sugar sand of Mount Baldy. That won't stop this driver though, and if he can't drive to the top, he'll simply pull himself. The driver maneuvers the backhoe like an expert, plunging it deep into the sand, then using the powerful engine to literally pull the backhoe up the side of the massive dune. After four hours, the backhoe is finally in position to begin digging. Faith is nearly hysterical at this point. Her nerves have been shot by watching the fine sand fill in all the hard work the rescuers do. When the backhoe is in position, she screams out that they're going to chop Nathan in half with a massive scoop. The rescue workers try to calm her down, and one of them takes a large rod and begins to prod the sand. Only after meticulously but quickly checking several feet of sand, the OK is given for the backhoe to move into action. The big machine is finally winning the fight against Mount Baldy, but it's forced to dig only two inches at a time to avoid accidentally hitting Nathan's buried body. Greg and Faith are encouraged to leave the rescue site and return to the police station with a patrol car. There, they're giving blankets to cover themselves with, they're still in their swimwear, and dusk is approaching. The police try to comfort the distraught pair, promising that every effort's being made to recover Nathan. None of the police officers mentions that at this point they're looking for a body to at least give the grieving family a chance to say goodbye. Nobody knows if they can find the body though, given the incredible size of the sand dune. Nathan might be lost forever. Their family's last memories of their little boy being him calling out for help from beneath several feet of sand. Back at the rescue site though, the probe finally strikes something solid. Carefully, the backhoe is maneuvered to slowly scrape away several inches of sand. The probe confirms that they're nearing a solid object, what must be Nathan. The men dig with their bare hands, but suddenly the sand shifts and Nathan slips even deeper into the sand dune. The backhoe is put to work once more, quickly but delicately digging away at tons of sand. Finally, a firefighter brushes away a layer of sand and sees the blonde hair on the top of Nathan's head. He begins to frantically dig, praying that the effort doesn't cause him to simply sink further. Finally, he manages to uncover Nathan down to his armpits, and with a furious effort, he and a few others pull Nathan free. The firefighter who found him fights back his own grief. Nathan reminds him of his own little boy. Nathan is unresponsive. The firefighters wipe the sand off of Nathan's face and cheeks for breath. Nothing. He puts an ear to his chest, hoping against hope to hear a heartbeat. Once more, nothing. They won't give up though, not after this much fighting. Nathan is passed down the side of the dune from man to man and rushed to a lifeguard truck, then to a waiting ambulance. Kicking up gravel, the ambulance immediately rushes to the hospital, the paramedics trying to insert a breathing tube to begin to manually force oxygen into Nathan's lungs, but his lungs are full of sand. They barely manage to get any air into his tiny body, but keep trying anyway. Things look very grim. Aside from not breathing, Nathan is freezing cold. At a depth of approximately 20 feet, the sand retains the icy cold temperatures of Lake Michigan, turning it into a refrigerator. But modern medical science has a rule. You're not dead until you're warm and dead. There's still a chance, no matter how faint. Nathan's parents are told their little boy has been found, and a police unit rushes them to the hospital. Doctors won't tell them what's going on though, they have no idea if Nathan is alive or not. They piece together that he was found unresponsive, but they aren't sure what that actually means. Behind closed doors, doctors are furiously working to save Nathan. They have room to hope. On the way to the hospital, Nathan had suddenly begun to bleed, likely from a cut on his forehead. This was evidence of a heartbeat. Incredibly, the icy sand had actually worked to save Nathan's life, lowering his body temperature to the point that his body required little oxygen to survive. But coming back to consciousness is another thing entirely. As doctors vacuum sand out of his lungs and stomach, they fear that Nathan's brain has been starved of oxygen for so long that it suffered irreparable damage. All that could be left of Nathan is the most basic of brain functions, heart beating, lungs breathing, and nothing more. Then suddenly, Nathan regains consciousness. His parents are told that their boy is not only alive but actually speaking. It's nothing short of an outright miracle and one that will continue to defy the odds. Within two weeks, Nathan will be home and playing with his siblings, with absolutely zero lingering side effects.
Dogs are a man's best friend, or in some cases a woman's best friend. Endurance runner Danell Balangi certainly thinks so. One chilly winter afternoon, Danell found out just how loyal, smart, and amazing her dog was. While hiking in the Moab, Utah desert with her dog Tasman, Taz for short, Danell suffered a horrible accident. This is the amazing story of how Danell's goofy, hyper, squirrel-chasing mutt helped to save her life. Wednesday, December 13, 2006 was chilly, with temperatures in the mid-40s, 7-ish Celsius. Just before noon, 35-year-old Danelle and her 3-year-old Taz headed out for a hike. Danelle was dressed comfortably for a short run in baggy running pants and a fleece hat. She had a few layers on her torso for warmth, silk long underwear, a water-resistant shirt, and a thin fleece jacket. She also had on gloves. While locking her phone and wallet in her truck near the trailhead, Danelle almost forgot her fanny pack which contained a bottle of water, two raspberry-flavored energy gels, two ibuprofen pills, and a plastic shower cap from her last race. Adventure racers will often put on a shower cap over their hats to prevent heat loss. Despite the cold, it was sunny as Danelle and Taz started their run. The 90-minute, 8-mile trek through the sandy red desert with its stunning rock formations was one of her favorites. Her route began on the popular Amasa Back Trail and then veered off it after a few miles onto a more obscure jeep trail used mainly by locals known as the Minesweeper. From there, Danelle would scramble up the side of a hidden canyon and head toward Hurrah Pass, eventually looping back around to a road that led her to her truck. As always, Taz happily ran beside Danelle, occasionally darting off to investigate small creatures. An hour into her run, with five miles completed, tragedy struck. While navigating a steep slope, Danelle stepped on a patch of frozen lichen and her feet slipped out from under her. She skidded down an icy rock face on her butt, rapidly picking up speed. Out of control, she bounced off one ridge and then another before free-falling some 40 feet in a luge position. She slammed into a four-foot square ledge landing on her feet. Below the ledge was another sheer drop. Danelle surely would have died if she had missed hitting the protrusion. The pain was excruciating. Danelle lay there a moment, stunned. The wind knocked out of her. Worried that she was paralyzed, she felt her legs. Thankfully, she could feel her hands touching her legs. But when Danelle tried to stand up, she couldn't. She didn't know what was wrong, but her lower torso simply wouldn't support her weight. Later, Danelle would learn that on impact, her pelvis had shattered, with cracks throughout and breaks in four places. Three of her vertebrae were fractured and her sacrum was split down the middle. Danelle knew she had to get out of the canyon. She hadn't told anyone where she was going, and she needed to reach an area where it was likely for her to be discovered. Also, Taz had managed to find his way to Danelle, so she knew there had to be a way out. At this point, endorphins and adrenaline were coursing through Danelle's body helping with the pain. However, her left leg wouldn't move. Through sheer strength of will, Danelle scooted forward on her right knee, balanced, then reached back with her hands and dragged her left leg forward. Slowly, carefully maneuvering, Danelle reached the bottom of the canyon. She looked at her fanny pack and found the ibuprofen. She swallowed the pills and kept crawling. She battled through sand, brush, and some snow. Eventually, Danelle reached a flat rock near a sinkhole filled with water. Exhausted and in great pain, she decided to rest here for a bit. It was around 5 p.m. and it had taken her nearly five hours to crawl a quarter of a mile. Since it was growing dark, Danelle decided to stay by the sinkhole for the night. She drank the remaining half of her water bottle and tucked her hands between her legs because they were so cold. In the meantime, a swollen lump the size of her fist had formed on her abdomen. Her massive injuries were bleeding internally. Danelle decided that being thirsty was worse than maybe getting parasites from the sinkhole. She wanted to fill her water bottle, but it hurt too much to turn over. She reached backward over her right shoulder and filled the water bottle without looking. However, she only allowed herself to drink a few sips of water. Danelle knew that if she drank more than her body absolutely needed, she would pee the excess water out. Since she couldn't move, she'd wet herself. The urine would eventually freeze on her clothes and skin, driving down her core temperature and making it more likely that she'd freeze to death. Danelle ate sparingly of an energy gel, rationing the rest for later. As the night wore on, the temperature dropped into the 20s. Danelle worried about hypothermia. She didn't want to fall asleep. She was afraid that she'd never wake up. To keep her core warm, she did mini crunches, raising her head and neck. Periodically, she rubbed her hands and tapped her feet on the rocks. 
Taz snuggled next to her and his body heat helped. She couldn't turn over to cuddle with him though, it hurt too much. Exhausted and freezing, Danelle stared up at the night sky. There was no moon, the stars were abundant and amazing. The next morning, Danelle was cheered up by watching Taz play with a stick. She ate a bit of energy gel. She tried to refill her water bottle, but the water in the sinkhole had frozen overnight. She reached over her shoulder and broke through the ice with the cap of her bottle. Danelle spent 10 hours on the second day screaming for help. A few times she thought she had hurt someone, but nobody appeared. Taz spent the day running off and returning each trek longer than the last. Danelle appreciated the warmth of the daylight as the sun made its way across the sky. Every now and then, she'd allow herself a little water or a bit of energy gel. However, as afternoon became evening, shadows once again grew in the canyon. Danelle saw the shower cap from her fanny pack a few feet away. She realized it would help her keep warm at night. It took her an hour to crawl two feet to reach it. Meanwhile, a neighbor of Danelle's noticed something quite odd. All the lights had been on at Danelle's house for a few days. Peering through the window, she could see Danelle's laptop on a table and the doors were unlocked. Worried, she called Danelle's parents. As it so happened, Danelle's parents were also concerned. They hadn't been able to reach her. They called the police for a welfare check. The police visited Danelle's house but found no signs of foul play. It just looked like Danelle left without locking up. The second night in the canyon was worse. Danelle's frostbite was growing, as was the bulge of internal hemorrhaging in her midsection. The pain was unbearable. Taz wouldn't snuggle with her. She wondered if her screaming for help all day had frightened him. Danelle thought about her life, her friends, her family, wishing that she had told them more often how much she loved them. For a while, Danelle kept up her crunches and tapping to keep warm, but eventually stopped, overwhelmed with despair. She couldn't see the stars. The dark night was full of long, white stripes. She knew her body was shutting down and that she was probably hallucinating. Suddenly, a voice began urging Danelle to keep tapping, so she did. On Friday morning, Danelle dragged herself off the rock. Her pants came off because she couldn't lift her butt off the ground. She found herself worse off than before, stuck in a shallow depression. She spent two hours crawling back onto the rock. Taz kept disappearing for longer and longer periods of time. He would suddenly reappear to lick her face before disappearing again. Later, Danelle would realize that Taz was running the five miles to the trailhead looking for help before coming back to check on her. He did this even though he hadn't eaten in three days. Meanwhile, on a hunch, the detective assigned to Danelle's case decided to check out parking lots for local trails. He eventually discovered Danelle's truck tucked away in a little-known parking area near the Amasa Back Trail. At 1.04 p.m., he alerted Grand County Search and Rescue that Danelle could be lost in the desert. A rescue team quickly assembled at the trailhead and was organizing equipment and going over a plan when Taz showed up. He barked and ran in circles but wouldn't allow anyone to catch him. The rescuers realized that he was Danelle's dog and thought that they should follow him. Initially, Tad led rescuers away from the trailhead back toward town. They thought that was odd, but followed. Once Taz realized that the rescuers were following him, he turned around, almost like he knew he had attracted enough attention, one rescuer said. The dog darted through the search party and took off toward the canyons. Unfortunately, the rescuers couldn't keep up, but realizing that Taz would soon pass some other searchers who were riding ATVs further up the trail, they hastily radioed them to follow the dog. Taz soon dashed past the ATV of Bego Gerhardt, an Eagle Scout and frequent rescue volunteer. Taz stopped to look at Bego who followed him. Taz ran further up the trail and stopped to look at Bego again before disappearing. Thankfully, Bego knew how to track. He found fresh dog prints, dog prints that were a few days old, and footprints that looked like they could have been made by Danelle. Bego hurried back to his ATV and drove through the canyon following the tracks. Danelle had finally crawled back onto the rock and was laying there when Taz returned again. This time, he ran to the sinkhole puddle behind Danelle and started drinking. He drank and drank. He was really thirsty. Danelle started worrying about her water supply and yelled at him. Suddenly, realizing the absurdity of the situation, Danelle wasn't angry anymore. A kind of peace spread through her. She was prepared to die. Not long afterwards, Danelle heard the sounds of Bego's ATV. At 3.38 p.m., he found Danelle alive, lying on her back. Next to her was Taz, his snout on his chest. Danelle wept, saying that she was so glad to see Bego. He was amazed that, considering her injuries, Danelle was still lucid. He quickly wrapped her in his sleeping bag, shoved her hands into heavy gloves, and radioed the team that he had found her. Forty-five minutes later, another rescuer arrived on the scene, and soon after that, the chopper arrived. Danelle was found at about 4,800 feet, in a rugged, slim canyon, just in time. Due to the weather and the rapidly fading light, the chopper had a very narrow space of time before it would be impossible for a rescue via airlift. 
Danelle was choppered to the hospital. Taz was taken home for the night by the officer in charge of the rescue. He didn't think it was fair that Taz should go to the humane shelter after his heroic effort. Danelle may have been finally rescued, but her ordeal was far from over. Five foot five inches tall, Danelle weighed 120 pounds before the accident. In the hospital, they discovered that she had dropped 20 pounds during her ordeal and lost one third of her blood volume. Doctors told her that most people would die in the first 24 hours sustaining similar injuries with that much blood loss. Danelle was very lucky to be alive. The only reason she was only able to survive for 56 hours before for the rescue was because of her mental strength and amazing level of fitness. Danelle underwent a risky six-hour surgery. Doctors reconstructed her pelvis with a titanium plate and a number of pins and screws. She also suffered from frostbite and had a number of scrapes and cuts. Word began to get out about Danelle's incredible survival. However, she wasn't really interested in talking to the media. Then, the popular morning news program The Today Show made her an offer she couldn't refuse. They wanted to interview her with Taz. Danelle, who hadn't seen Taz since she was airlifted out of the canyon several days before, quickly agreed. Danelle was wheeled down to the hospital lobby and Taz was allowed in. Danelle and Taz were delighted to be reunited. After the Today Show finished shooting, Taz went home with Danelle's sister, but he escaped, made his way back to the hospital and tried to sneak in. Accolades, cards, and letters poured in for Taz, and some for Danelle too. One fan even sent Taz a Christmas present. In a box filled with dry ice were five pounds of hormone-free aged rib steaks and red and white Christmas stocking with a stuffed Santa inside. Also, Taz received a couple of awards, including an award for his valor from the National Society for the Ethical Treatment of Pets and the RSPCA National Hero Dog Award. Danelle stayed in the hospital for 15 days. Then she was in a wheelchair for several weeks and underwent months of physical therapy. Moving slower, but with plenty of determination, soon Danelle and Taz were back to hiking on the trails around Moab. Some five months after the accident, Danelle entered her first race. She walked more than she ran, but that was only the beginning. Reflecting on her ordeal, Danelle isn't sure what to make of the voice that urged her to keep tapping during the second night. She isn't particularly religious. She said, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to be the best person I can. I'm okay without an answer. Today, Danelle still competes in endurance events. She also coaches athletes and oversees races. After a long and happy life, Taz passed away in the spring of 2019. He is sorely missed by his friend Danelle. In one of the most remote and unforgiving wildernesses in the world, two strangers sit huddled in a makeshift tent they've built. The man and the young woman are freezing and on the verge of death. A snowstorm batters their makeshift tent. The wind blasts seem to the pair like nature itself has a vendetta against them. They are miles away from any town, and what they don't know is that as they sit and wait, the media is saying there is little hope the missing pair will be found alive. The storm abates, and suddenly the woman sees a plane in the sky, but her hope is crushed as it fades into the distance. In the name of God, she says, please come back. She's well aware she doesn't have long to live. The story starts at the beginning of the 1960s, a decade that would become renowned for its decadence and colorful youth culture. Just prior to that decade, there was the Beat Movement, a counterculture that enshrined something that would become known as the Road Trip, with Jack Kerouac's book On the Road inspiring many young Americans to take off and explore their own country from end to end. And that's just what a young Jewish girl from New York named Helen Klaben wanted to do, to follow in the footsteps of people who turned away from convention and instead went looking for adventure. When Klaben was just 20 years old, she saw an ad in the newspaper asking if anyone wanted to share the gas costs and take a car all the way to Fairbanks, Alaska. She replied, and the two set off on a long journey. After a few months in Alaska, she knew where she wanted to explore next, and that was the mystical East. She wasn't sure where she'd go exactly, maybe India, maybe Hong Kong, but before that she had to get to a destination to take a flight across the world. That destination was San Francisco, a city on the verge of a cultural revolution. Early in 1963, Clavin met a 41-year-old Mexican-American amateur pilot by the name of Ralph Flores. He was an aircraft mechanic that hailed from California, and he too wanted to get back home and leave Alaska. The pair agreed to share the expenses of the journey, and off they went to their first destination, which was the capital of the Yukon Territory, Whitehorse, the most populated place in that wild part of the world. They had another stop after that, and that was at Fort St. John in British Columbia. It was winter and bitterly cold. Snowstorms raged and the plane was grounded for three days. A small single-engine airplane couldn't hope to fly over such an unforgiving territory in such bad conditions. Nonetheless, with the weather warning still present, the two took off again into the sky. 
their next landing would be anything but smooth. The pair flew for hours in strong winds, the plane being tossed around like a dandelion seed in a strong breeze. Flores could hardly see anything with the snow blasting against the plane. He and Clavin knew they somehow had to get out of that storm, so Flores attempted to get above the clouds and out of danger. His plan was to come back down and find the Alaska Highway, which would lead him to the airport. That was the thing. He needed the road to get his bearings because, being an amateur, he didn't quite understand the instruments in the aircraft. On top of that, he hadn't even packed emergency supplies on board in case of a crash. There were no real tools, not much in terms of food supplies, nothing to keep someone warm, and not even a gun in case they came up against a rather hungry animal. The Yukon is full of bears, small ones, large ones, and utterly fearsome ones. They at least had a knife. It was a time of desperation and Clavin started to lose her cool. She knew that the pilot was totally lost, but he refused to admit that. Then she suddenly saw a mountainside and some trees, and she knew they were going to crash. She said to herself, OK, Helen, here it comes, and it came with a bang. She closed her eyes and just hoped for the best, and when she opened them, she was alive. The plane had landed at the side of a mountain close to the Yukon-British Columbia border. She had a broken arm, and she had some broken ribs and a fractured jaw. There was nothing but mountains and trees around, and snow covered everything. Just walking around was an effort because the temperature at times would go down to negative 45 degrees Celsius. They huddled in the wreckage of the plane to escape the blistering cold. Frostbite was a certainty in these conditions if they stayed out too long in the open. As days went by, search parties flew over the skies and looked for the pair, but it was incredibly difficult to see anything in between the trees when everything is covered with snow. They literally had nothing to eat after they finished off some cans of sardines, tuna, fruit, and some crackers. There were no supplies at all after that, and they were only 10 days in. The one important thing they could do to survive was to melt snow for water. They had a box of matches and so could make a fire. With both of them in pain from their injuries and without the equipment to hunt, they just sat and waited and starved. Day by day, the pounds came off as their bodies burned their own fat reserves. Flores did try and make something that looked like a slingshot, but it was useless, and he soon gave up on hunting rabbits. They did have another thing, though, and in a way, you might call that an emergency supply for the religious mind. It was a Bible, something Flores took everywhere with him since he'd converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He was a devout Mormon. He told Clavin that this crash they'd experienced had some significance in regard to the bigger picture of things. He told her to read the Bible and they would be saved. She had to convert. Each day, they heard planes rumbling overhead, and each day Clavin continued reading the Bible, hoping her devout accomplice was right about his God. He actually told her that if she read the whole thing and then accepted the divinity of Jesus Christ, they would be saved. She wasn't exactly comforted by this and didn't believe him, but hey, there wasn't that much reading material in the middle of nowhere. Weeks now passed and they made a discovery. They found toothpaste, and that suddenly started looking tasty. Each day they squeezed the tube and gratefully swallowed the minty cream. They knew it wasn't really sustenance, but it was at least something to put in their mouths. They also had chewing gum and they chewed that for weeks on end. Things got desperate after a few weeks, and while they could at least keep themselves a little bit warm with insulation they made out of clothes and cushions, Clavin got serious frostbite and then gangrene in her foot. She could now hardly move at all. She was all but ready to give up the ghost and had lost about a third of her body weight. Flores just told her to keep reading that Bible and never give up hope of rescue. Still, as time went by, even he seemed to have given up on one of those planes in the sky seeing them. Flores then told Clavin that since he could walk, he would go and try to find civilization. He walked off in the woods, leaving her behind to her own thoughts. She decided to write about what happened, but soon gave up on that when it started to sound like an epitaph. She wasn't ready to sign off just yet. Eight days later and Flores came back, he told his dying companion that he had at least found what looked like a clearing and so humans might have been there. There was also much more chance of someone seeing them from the sky once they were away from all the trees. They had to walk there and make a shack of some sort. It took hours to get there. Clavin's foot was badly infected now and the pain of walking was unbearable. As they got closer to the clearing, they heard a noise, like a humming, in the distance. Flores went in search of that noise and then returned some time later. He told Clavin he'd found a frozen pond and that he'd written SOS in it and also etched the shape of an arrow that pointed to where they were. He'd done this with the snowshoes he'd made out of tree bark. He told Clavin he'd go out again with a mirror and try to catch sight of the pilot. She didn't want to be alone again, but he assured her that it was the only option now. Was there hope? 
It was day 47 of their ordeal, a day after Clavin had finished reading the Bible. And now we introduce you to a man of the wild, one Charles Chuck Hamilton. In March that year, as those two were freezing and starving to death, he was out in his plane trying to spot animals to hunt. He had a good eye for that kind of thing. He spotted no moose that day, but he did see SOS written into what looked like a frozen pond. He didn't immediately think about the missing plane. That had been weeks ago, and it wasn't something that was still on his mind. In fact, he and his passenger thought that the remark must have been left by a trapper, seeing as trappers did sometimes find themselves in difficulty in the wild. At the same time, Clavin had seen the plane in the sky. She made a fire and frantically threw green pine on it. Black smoke gushed into the sky. Surely, someone would see that. She was now in tears, full of desperate joy, ignoring the pain in her foot. Flores was out in the woods trying to use the mirror to flash sunlight back at the plane. Hamilton actually had to turn away from the black smoke since it was so thick and heavy, but it was then he saw a man standing with a mirror in his hands. Hamilton found a place to set down the plane near a cabin on an airport lake. He was about six miles away from the pair. Trappers were working at this cabin and that's the noise the pair had heard. The trappers had been cutting firewood with the chainsaw. All these men got together with their dogs and set off to find the man with the mirror. Because of the smoke, Clavin hadn't yet been seen. Hamilton then left the trappers and said he'd investigate from the sky again, but now that fire had died down. When he looked at where the fire had been, he could just make out a tent. He then made a radio call and said, I think I found the lost people. Night was now falling, and so Hamilton returned home, hoping the trappers had found those people. The media called him all night long, but he couldn't sleep anyway, thinking about the poor souls alone out there. At this point, no one knew if there was just one survivor or two, since only the man with the mirror had been seen. Hamilton only guessed the woman was the source of the fire. The trappers actually did find Flores that night, but Clavin waited the whole night alone at the shelter. It was now pitch black and the rescue would have to wait until morning. Hamilton actually turned to his wife and said, what if she's dead when I get there? He flew off before dawn and landed a couple miles from where that tent was. From there, he walked in and about one hour later, Clavin saw a hulk of a man striding toward her. A man she said was pixie-faced. When he met her, she embraced him and cried and kissed his grizzled cheek. The brave woman said she could walk out even with a terribly infected frostbitten foot. Hamilton responded to that saying, if I can carry a moose out of the woods, I can carry you. It took some time though, walking on snowshoes with a woman on his back, a frail woman at least, who now only weighed 100 pounds. When Clavin was finally taken to a hospital, the doctor said she wouldn't have lasted one more night. Had they stayed another night, that SOS in the lake would have been covered. They were discovered in the nick of time. When Clavin was well enough, she met with a host of reporters, to whom she claimed, hey, I'm alive. She was all good except a few missing toes. Clavin soon went back to Brooklyn and Flores went home to his family in California. She never did convert and become a Mormon, but she later said the ordeal did make her more spiritual. The experience, she said, helped her to find herself. In an interview, she said most people expect they'd not be able to cope with the crisis and it was a great experience to find out that I could. Clavin wrote a book about what had happened and never lost her sense of adventure, traveling through many regions of Asia and Europe and the Americas. She died in 2018, age 76. Flores was also 76 when he passed away in 1997, so we guess these two had one last experience they could share. The now old Chuck Hamilton left the wilds and moved to Victoria, where he lives today with his family. He keeps a token of the event in his basement, a bit of the wreckage with the serial number N5886. There's one simple response to the question we are asking today, and that is, it ain't easy. We used to do it all the time, survive in the wild, when we were hunter-gatherers, of course, for many thousands of years. Yet these days, most of us would be pretty useless if dropped off in the jungles of Southeast Asia, or if expected to survive alone in a huge forest. We might recall the movie Into the Wild, in which one young man attempts to leave the city and live in nature. He doesn't last very long. Could celebrity survivalist Bear Grylls even survive, if the TV cameras, nurses, and other staff weren't on hand to help? Well, today we'll see how best we might cope alone out there, in this episode of the Infographic Show, How to Survive in the Wilderness. Okay, let's first look at the word wilderness, because it has many meanings. It could mean a wasteland, or even the open sea, but what we are really asking today is how to survive in what one dictionary calls a wild and uncultivated region, uninhabited, or inhabited only by wild animals. This definition could include forests and deserts, but as most of us don't live in deserts, today we will focus on forests. After all, it's likely many of us have walked through forests, and some of us may even have been lost in one. The first thing is, did you tell anyone where you were going? If you didn't, you might be one of the least smart people on the planet. You should always tell someone where you plan to go, especially if you go alone. 
Remember the guy from the movie 127 Hours? The one that had to hack off his own arm with a dull blade? He didn't tell anyone where he was going. We think you get the picture. But let's say this trip of yours was a personal pilgrimage. Something meaningful and private and so you didn't tell anyone. You didn't even take your phone because you wanted total detachment from the world. So, you are lost, and you are well aware that you are far, far away from any communities. According to some experts, the first thing you should do is not panic. Panicking will lead to mistakes, and you need to conserve your energy. So, you are calm, and you know that the first thing you need to do is find a water source. As our bodies are 60% water, and even the strongest among us can only go a week without it. For most people, it's 3 or 4 days. One expert told Fox News, you can go 100 hours without drinking at an average temperature outdoors. If it's cooler, you can go a little longer. If you are exposed to direct sunlight, it's less. Obviously, if you are walking and sweating, things get worse. So, you look at your water situation. You have some water, of course, but how long will it last you? This is actually called survival hydration, but it's not an exact science. One survival site we found says you need to replace less than you lose through sweating, breathing, and urinating, and it came to the conclusion that the minimum to survive for a 154-pound person is about 1 liter or a little over 4 cups of water a day. This is to stay tip-top at least. It's important to note that the site says do not take little sips all day, wait 4 or 6 hours and have a big gulp so the body knows the drought is over. If you've got salt, dissolve some of that in your mouth first, as it will act as an electrolyte. It's also important that it's a tiny bit of salt for each big gulp, about 1 16th of a teaspoon. Okay, so you know how best to ration your water. What next? Well, look around you. What kind of food do you have? You can go weeks without food. Some people fast for 5 to 10 days and don't keel over. But if you are on the move, you will want to ration your food. Obviously, you should first eat anything that will perish soon, Ideally, a man needs at least 1,700 calories a day to have a good amount of energy, so look at your food and try to work out how many calories you have. You don't want to eat all the calorific food on the first day. You'll have to do some math, even if you're hoping to get out of your predicament before your food runs out. If you don't have much food, or even any food, if you happen to know what plants and berries to eat, then have some, but be careful, because picking the wrong thing could kill you or at least make you very sick. In the wild, some things are your best buddies in terms of eating, and they are bugs, eggs, fruit, and edible leaves. The backpacker Yossi Ginsberg, who survived in the Amazon for several weeks, ate tons of eggs, especially ant eggs. Yummy. As Bear Grill says, this is not a time to be squeamish. Eat all the insects and animals you can if you are hungry. You could set traps for bigger animals, but that's not as easy as it looks. If you have a gun, of course that will help. The simplest trap is a stick barely holding up some kind of hood you have fashioned. Put some food in there, and hopefully when you wake up, something got in and the hood fell on it. If you are next to water, you can also make a spear, which is easy enough if you have a knife, and try to spear some fish. You should cook them as they contain bacteria, viruses, and parasites, but if that's not possible and you are starving to death, try to eat only the meat on the fish. That said, you'd be better off looking for bird's eggs. So, you know how much food and water you have, and roughly how long you can last. What else do you have? Did you bring matches or a lighter? You better make sure to keep them dry. If you have anything you absolutely don't need and it's heavy, say you brought a framed picture of your dog, dump it. But be careful what you throw away. For example, don't dump any heavy books because you could use the pages to get a fire going. If you have no matches or lighter, you can take two pieces of dry wood, one a sharpened stick and the other a larger piece of wood, put wispy kindling next to where you will drill, using a rub motion with the stick, and you should get a spark. Make sure you have your book or small pieces of dry wood nearby. Now you are ready. If you remember seeing a water source, then head there, but don't build a home there as it could flood. It depends on the season, of course, so if it's scorching hot, build higher than the river by quite a bit, but also in the shade. You should be an easy walking distance to your water source, which will likely be either a stream, river, or lake. Springs and streams have the cleanest and safest water to drink. You might even be in a muddy area where you can dig a hole about one foot deep so that water collects in it. It's not pleasant to drink, but you can strain it through a cloth. With rivers or lakes, you should use purification tablets if you have them, and if not, boil the water. Even solar power works to kill nasty things, so if you have time, you could leave your collected water out in the sun. If you cannot do either of those things, it's better to risk dirty water than dying. If you are not near a water source and it rains, collect the stuff, put out containers if you have some, or spread a piece of plastic between trees. Now you can build a shelter, which could be a simple lean-to, just a T-frame with branches and leaves laid over it. You might also consider not building on an ant's nest. 
getting bitten all over could be a nightmare. So what if you built a shelter, have some water, but want to get on the move the next day? If you can find a trail that someone has already traversed, get on that. If you can't, and you don't have a compass, you might have to use the stars or the sun, or just follow the river if there is one. By the way, if you see no river, head downwards, as that's usually where they are. You must keep walking, stay near water if you can, and keep replenishing your food stock. When you light a fire, hopefully someone will see the smoke. Fires at night also keep you warm, scare away animals, and repel bugs. You can also use a fire to know how the weather is, or will be. If there is low pressure, the smoke will stir about or fall, meaning rain could be on the way. If it just rises up, then that means high pressure, and you should have a clear day. Now that you know how to survive, the rest is about getting out. As we said, make lots of smoke, and if you move on, look for trails, people on the river, or any signs humans have been near. Follow those signs, and if possible, leave signs of your own that you've been around. The fire should suffice. So, if you were forced to survive in the wilderness, what measures would you take to keep yourself alive that we haven't already mentioned? Let us know in the comments. Also, be sure to check out our other video called What Would Happen to Your Body If You Lived in the Bathtub? Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you next time!